And welcome everybody to the Gym Masters Show live worldwide. It's good to have you with us. Hope you're having a great day, whether it's the morning, maybe in Australia and New Zealand for all of our Australian and uh, folks from New Zealand, the, the fabulous audience we have that's there down under. Maybe you're watching in Africa or South America or Asia. We have viewers that watch this show from all points of the globe. Our faithful audience watching in Europe and Ireland and England and in Spain and France and Italy and Switzerland and Austria and Norway and Sweden and Finland. It's absolutely amazing. And of course, all across the United States and in Canada, I'm your host, Jim Masters, and this is our entertainment lifestyle talk show series exclusively here on YouTube at Jim Masters TV and also on Facebook at Jim Masters TV. This is week number 15. We have done well over 100 plus shows already because we do shows every single night live, 7 p.m. Eastern and 4 p.m. Pacific right here on the Gym Master Show Live. It's an entertainment lifestyle talk show series that we created. And I really appreciate all the love, all the support, all the, the kind words, all the messages throughout the day and the Facebook posts and the posts and comments on YouTube, all the private messages, the tagging and the sharing and the promoting and inviting people to watch the show and sample the show. And we're booked with guests now till the third week of October. And it's only August right now. We just launched the show 15 weeks ago. Every single night, we have amazing guests. A lot of them are friends of mine from the worlds of television and film, uh, music, as well as uh, the creative arts of Broadway and Hollywood, health and wellness and science and culinary arts and sports, you name it, all right here. And we've got some amazing shows uh, in store coming up every single night, something different, something unique. The show is all about light, love, and levity, or lovity, as you guys have called it. And we are welcoming all the loveties from all around the world. We thank you for tuning in to the show, and you're in for a great treat tonight because we have a legend. We have somebody who uh, has so many incredible, riveting, and powerful stories to share with us. And um, if you're a fan of uh, the movies, or if you're a fan of television, or if you're a fan of sports, boxing, or any of the above, or all of the above, you know this guy. This is Jack O'Halloran. He is unbelievable. Great guy. He's salt of the earth. We were just having a great conversation. I love the conversations we have before we go on the air. Uh, you know, born in Philly and raised in New Jersey, and then he was a boxer out of Boston and a heavyweight boxer as well and went up against some of the most incredible uh, of the time. He really is a legend in the, the boxing uh, area and also in film and television. He's uh, an incredible actor and producer and writer and so much more, as well as an author. He has an incredible book about uh, family, family legacy. And uh, he was just telling me, sort of an exclusive here on the show, two more books are in the works. So if you read Family Legacy, which is riveting to say the least, it really sucks you in. It's an amazing story that he shares with the readers. Um, you're going to you're gonna dive into the next two books that he's penning as we speak. So in just a moment, we are going to have a legend with us here, um, and I'm so honored and pleased to have him here. Again, he's a straight shooter. He's authentic. He's a regular guy. He's approachable, and you have a really good conversation with him, and that's what I like. And he's uh, proud of that Irish heritage, too, and uh, they called him Irish and the giant and so much more because he is a giant in the industry. So uh, Jack's going to be with us in just a minute. I hope you're having a terrific day wherever you're watching around the world. Tell your friends that we've got uh, Jack here on the show. And I want to do our usual open, which is welcome our cast of characters. There's George Burns. <laughs> Again, remember, we had a nostalgic show a couple of weeks ago. We brought George on. There he is. And he says hello to you and you and you. I'll bring him a little closer for you. There he's got his cigar. <laughs> so he greets all the viewers. He greets you from all around the world. He's a staple here on the Gym Master Show Entertainment Lifestyle Talk Show Series. Everybody wants him on the show. And if I don't bring George on, people start posting, hey, where's George? Is George there tonight? So George is here and he greets you, as does 
especially with my television background, Jeannie. And Jeannie is here in the official I Dream of Jeannie bottle. And there she is. And you see her in there. She's looking at you. She's blinking at you. And she's wishing you uh, well. She's hoping you're doing well. So Jeannie is here as well. Again, as you guys know, I'm a professional television and radio personality, host, journalist, actor, writer, producer, voiceover artist, stage MC. So I work in the medium of broadcasting professionally. And we created this show, uh, which has just been growing by leaps and bounds. And it really uh, touches me how you guys respond and you tell each other. And we have our cast of regulars as well who are with us every night and more new people discovering the show. And that's a blessing and that's really amazing. So we really appreciate that. And of course, the Silver Lab is here that you guys love. There is Silver, who we got on a TV shoot in Europe. Good looking dog, huh? He sort of watches out for us here. He makes sure everything is under control here at our home studio for the Gym Master Show. We got him in Switzerland when we were on a TV shoot. So he greets all of you guys as well. <laughs> Everybody falls in love with these cast of characters. And we've got another one here that you guys want to have on the show continually. And there he is. It is the clown. It's Jimmy. And Jimmy says hello to you as well. Again, you know, with everything we've been going through the last uh, several months, some light, levity, positivity, inspiration, good times, information, education. That's what it's all about. We have a good time here on this show. And you're in store for a great show today. Uh, Jimmy says hello. And he greets you. This was a childhood toy, actually, that my parents got. And he's made of porcelain. And he's been holding up pretty well. So he greets you. And of course... If you haven't been with us, there's a new cast of character that's really special. And the reason why this cast of character, or this one of the characters in the cast, is special because it's a special gift that came in the mail after I did a special interview with the wife of Bob Denver. Bob Denver, who played Gilligan on Gilligan's Island, and also was on Dobie Gillis and so much more. And you remember the brilliant and beautiful and inspirational Dreama Denver, right? When they, we did that uh, Saturday night episode of our series, and we had that incredible conversation, and she was so open and so authentic. And then she saw these different characters in our cast of characters. She says, you know what, Jim? You have to have a Gilligan, too. You got George and Jeannie and Silver and Jimmy. You got to have a Gilligan. I said, really? So she actually shipped to us, and we received it about two days ago, this big box, and inside was the official Gilligan. This comes from Bob Denver's fabulous wife, Dreama Denver, and she signed it. There it is. It says, Aloha, Jim, Dreama Denver. She was a delight to interview, a delight to meet. We've become friends. It's the bobblehead doll, too, for Bob Denver and for Gilligan. That was really a special thing that she did. She wanted to have him as a part of the show on the set. She said, you had to have a Gilligan. You got the George Burns and all the rest. So Gilligan is officially now part of our set. And he greets all of you as well. He sees all of you. And he says, you're going to have a good time tonight, okay? So Gilligan is here, Bob Denver, courtesy of uh, Dream of Denver, which was a beautiful, beautiful uh, gift. How is everybody doing? We'll greet some of you. And then we will greet our illustrious guest, of course, uh, Jack O'Halloran is coming here in just a moment. Looking forward to the show, Mr. Lovety. Thank you very much, Linda in Florida. Willie, who's watching in Holland in the Netherlands, tried and true. There's your Dutch tulips for you, Willie, because I know it's like 1.15 a.m. there in the Netherlands, and you're tried and true, a real trooper watching, tuning in. Sometimes you take a nap. Sometimes you stay up all day because you don't want to miss the show, and we really appreciate that. Yes, hello, Jim. We can enjoy the Jim Masters show again. Hello, everyone. You're watching on our YouTube channel, and we appreciate that. Good evening, Jim, and all the loveities watching on YouTube at Jim Masters TV. Christine in North Carolina, welcome. Willie sends the flowers direct from the Netherlands. We appreciate that. Renee in Iowa is here as well. Hi, everybody. Hope you're doing uh, well, Renee. Good to see you. Danilo watching in San Diego, California. Hello, fellow Lovities. Welcome to Lovity Hall. That's what we call it now. <laughs> you came up with Lovity Hall. I came up with the word Lovity by mistake when I was saying levity and love and slipped up. And all of a sudden, I said Lovity, and everybody seems to like that. And we could use some more of that in our world, I guess, huh? 
Um, and now it's Lovety Hall. This will be a dynamite show. Absolutely. Uh, Jack is uh, all primed and ready to go. He's such a great guest to have, and we're honored to have him here. Hi, Jim, sending you all the lovely in the world. You know, we were just talking about England moments ago in the United Kingdom with Jack because he lived in London. Uh, there's several places in the world he lived. He's in California now, originally from Philadelphia, then uh, uh, New Jersey, and then was in Boston and multitude of other places. He resides on the West Coast, California, but he lived in London. He was telling me about the brilliant London days, he lived on the Isle of Man, um, Ireland, all these fabulous places. So good to see you in Hampshire and the United Kingdom. Hi, Jim, sending you all the lovely in the world. Happy Friday to everyone. Love the show, Jim. Thank you very much. I'm glad you love it. Continue to tell your friends there and the United Kingdom. We have a lot of uh, <laughs> Irish and English uh, in us on both sides of the family. And Renee's here saying hello. And uh, Merlin is here in Inner Kip, Ontario, Canada. Hi, Jim and everyone. Good to see you as well. Welcome to our show tonight. Uh, Christopher Baker is watching. Hello, Jim. Good to see you as well. Cheers with your mention on the Paul W. Smith Show, WJR Radio 760. I've been featured several times in that great station. Yeah, I appreciate the folks at WJR Radio, that legendary station in Detroit, uh, mentioning the Jim Masters show live. That's really cool. And we posted on Facebook a, a huge shout out and thanks. And we really appreciate them doing that. That was a pleasant surprise. I didn't know they were going to do that. Here and good evening, Christine Fairward in Connecticut. Welcome. Also in Connecticut, Crystal Nolan. Hi, Jim and everyone. Happy Friday. I hope you're having a fantastic day. Looking forward to an exciting show. You got it. Absolutely. Coming right up, Crystal. A special hello to Gilligan. <laughs> And aloha as well. Yeah, that was really cool that Dreama sent that beautiful, beautiful gift. You guys love the Gilligan doll. Jennifer Barry is here. Hi, Jim and everyone. I'm here. Good to see you as well. Good evening from Linda in Florida as well. And all the other folks who are in with us now and will be tuning in a little bit later as well. We appreciate all of you here. Thanks and welcome. We have a very special guest with us. I've been really excited about, well, I love all the guests that we have. You know, we're very selective about the folks that are on the show and we've got some amazing guests coming up. But this guy here is truly, truly a legend, a legend in uh, television and movies and in the sports world and boxing. And there you may recognize him as one of the characters that he played. This is Jack O'Halloran and he is incredible. Irish Jack O'Halloran. He was actually a rated heavyweight boxing contender in the middle 60s and early 70s, the six foot six native of first Philadelphia and then New Jersey was considered one of boxing's most promising heavyweight hopefuls after he remained undefeated in his first 16 professional. Now, this is really incredible. I don't know if you knew if you knew him just from, you know, movies and from television and all remained undefeated in his first 16 professional matches. Jack went on to defeat former title contenders, Cleveland Williams, Terry Daniels, Manuel Ramos, and Denny McAllen. And also in 72, he won the California State Heavyweight Championship with a victory over Henry Clark, scoring an upset victory over eighth ranked Al Blue Lewis in 1973. Jack was on the verge of a bout with, believe it or not, Muhammad Ali. Yes. Um, and then there was a knockout with Jimmy Somerville in Miami Beach. Even though that occurred, um, he knocked out Somerville in the rematch. <laughs> and Jack was never in contention again after that. But he retired in 74. And um, he had a record of 34-21-2 with 17 knockout victories. And... Um, he did take on George Foreman and Ken Norton as well. He achieved world ranking for several years and was the California heavyweight champion in 72 and 73. He was also inducted into the California Boxing Hall of Fame and the New Jersey Boxing Hall of Fame as well. Following his retirement from boxing, he launched a very successful and long and illustrious career as a character actor in such films as Farewell, My Lovely in 1975, King Kong in 1976, Superman 
in 1978 as well. Superman II in 1980. Mm -hmm. The Baltimore Bullet, 1980. Hero and the Terror, 1988. Dragnet, 1987, and on and on. He's also uh, published a fantastic book, wrote and penned a book called Family Legacy. And we're going to talk about that uh, in just a moment. Um, he's really an extraordinary person. In, in, when you really think about it, he uh, has had several different lives, uh, almost kind of like a cat has nine lives, and has been able to master several different industries that are very demanding, first being boxing, and then, of course, being acting. He really uh, is a national treasure, and we're just going to, we'll go over these with Jack, but these are some of the different roles over the years that he was in, and of course, you may remember him from television and movies and, and from his brilliant uh, boxing career as well. Um, he really is a, uh, a living legend and somebody that uh, hears from, uh, of course, uh, Superman. And again, just showing you the multitude of things from boxing to a brilliant career acting, Superman 2 as well. Yes. And um, really, really incredible. Look at that. Isn't, isn't that amazing? And because of his height and because of his physical build, he was able to play these extraordinary roles. Of course, he's a handsome guy too, right? So, you know, but just really extraordinary career. Look at him there. You're not going to mess with him there. <laughs> Don't take a parking spot when you see that face on Jack's face. When you see that uh, reaction on his face, that look on his face. Don't take his parking spot. <laughs> That's a cool shot of him in action uh, in the ring. But again, uh, just truly a treasure and. He's really mastered so many different things in his life. And uh, we truly are honored to have him here on the show. Look at that. <laughs> Isn't that a great shot as well? But again, uh, he's an amazing individual. He gives back to the community. He helps, you know, he's mentored others who have been coming up the ranks as well. And it's my pleasure to welcome uh, living legend in so many different areas of uh, life and success, Jack Oh, Halloran. Jack, welcome to the show. It's an honor and a pleasure to have you here with us tonight. My pleasure. My pleasure, my friend. How are you doing tonight? How are you doing with all this craziness that's been going I'm doing on? the best I can, whatever let me get away with. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> exactly. So uh, are, have you been pretty much you know, in the house or have you been going out? Have you been doing... Yeah, I mean, really, there's no place to go. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, doing a lot of uh, business meetings and stuff on Zoom. And, yeah. Uh, doing a few of these podcasts and stuff because yeah. I'm here by the computer. Yeah. So, uh, now, and I'm writing. We've got a, uh, a few projects that we're doing. So we we have a couple more books coming out, and then we're taking Family Legacy, and we're going to do a mini series that will turn into a series. We're going to do a film, but – there's too much information, so yeah. the mini series covers it much better, you know. But, uh, and then we have a studio we're building in Nevada. I, oh, that's right, that's right. Tell us a little bit about that. That's exciting. Yeah, it's uh, something they should have done like 30 years ago. You know, we're we're putting a four million square foot studio in to encompass every bit of entertainment that there is. We're putting um, a water body. We'll cover television film, um, streaming, music, whatever. Anything you can think of in the entertainment business will be there. And it's uh, it's going to be – and then we're putting a smart city next to it that will house like twenty five to 30,000 people so people will only have to travel 15 minutes to go to work, which should be a blessing. That's going to be amazing. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah so It's – uh, and that's like I live here in Redondo. Yeah. If I'm going to do a picture of Warner Brothers. I've got an hour and a half traffic each way. Right. And so it's uh, and the people that are technicians, they live inland because it's cheaper for them, but they travel, you know, two and a half hours to go to work every day. One mm. way. Yes. So you know, four or five hours of your day 
is taking up travel and that's kind of a frustrating situation you know absolutely absolutely so that's going to be an amazing what was the uh inspiration the the germ of the idea to create that in nevada was that was there a void a place like that doesn't really exist there well, we started here in, in in california and back in 208 my partner and i we uh we had a great building the boeing building it was a terrific place in long beach to build the studio in between two major airports and uh and we had 40 sound stages we were going to put in it was a, and we we're addressing a lot of the problems of the industry but uh, this is even better yet because we've got so much space and we can build this the way we want to mm -hmm. and apply the technology and the data centers and everything else. And, uh, and it's really been needed for a long time. And then we're going to turn around and give a seven-year work contract to technicians, which give them job security. So it's, uh, yeah, we're looking forward to it. That's going to be fantastic. I just want to, uh, our audience, we're very viewer centric here on the show and we love the interaction with the viewers and Linda in Florida says, Jack was awesome in Superman. She loved you in Superman. And Crystal says, welcome to the show. And Linda says, welcome to the show as well. And uh, Avril, in, uh, we were talking about you living uh, in London and other places around the world. She's in Hampshire and United Kingdom watching our show live right now. Um, when you were in London, what was that like being in oh, London? I loved London. London yeah. was London was a great city. I, I, I went over there in the 60s to box it. I boxed at Albert Hall and the Grosvenor House and uh, I had several fights in England. And, uh, and I have a lot of good friends over there. And, you know, and then we did Superman. I lived uh, in Kensington, in Knightsbridge, in Kenogan Square for four years. And, you know, coming back and forth to America, but majority of the time was over there in England. Mm -hmm. And it, it, was, uh, it was great. I mean, I, I lived in, and I, I moved, I lived in Ireland for a while, I lived in the Isle of Man, I lived in Belgium, I lived in Italy. Uh, yeah, just, mm. you know. Yeah, yeah. That's great to have the opportunity to, to do that, Jack, and to really experience other parts of the world as well. Um, let's go back in time. I would love, I mentioned, you know, in the introduction, some of the, uh, some of the background, but early on in your, um, in your life, first born in Philly and then raised in New Jersey, um, what was it about boxing that spoke to uh what was it about that particular sport uh were there other boxers in the family did you have some that you looked up to uh you know the joe lewis's some of the others what was it about boxing that I, really you know, spoke I, to? I started out playing football yeah and um and it was in an era where you couldn't play pro ball until your class graduated college right so i was picked up when I left that one first year by the Jets and um, they had like a farm system in those days where we played in, in what they call like a semi-pro league, but they were all, we were all professionals. And uh, there was a team outside of Philly called Tinicum AC that I played on with Dick Christie, Jimmy Christie, a lot of people from the Jets mm -hmm. system. And when it came time to go up and play, uh, Philly had a great team, and I said to Eubank, I said, you know, I really like to get down and play with Philly because I have good friends down there, and the, and I think they're going to, you know, Jerry Wallman had just bought the team, but then he hired this guy Joe Kuharik, and and he came in and he traded a championship football team away in like three four months. I said, whoa! So Ali had just won the title, and I said to some friends of mine in Philadelphia, I could beat that guy. So I wound up in the gym, you know, <laughs> and they uh, took a shot at me fighting professional. And, and I would start out, did very extremely well. And, and they found out, they did a, a physical around my 16th, 17th fight that I had uh, what they call the tumor, tumor of the pituitary, which is a disease called acromegalia, and thought that I shouldn't be fighting at all. 
that, that they couldn't figure out how he even got up to, to get up to fight because it was a, it caused a lot of depression and stuff like that. And, uh, and if your body was putting out 10% growth hormone, mine was putting out 150. So it just sapped a lot of your energy, supposedly. But uh, it was a great day job because I was training to box in the daytime and I was taking care of my father's world at night and with the unions and stuff like that. And, uh, and, and you always had to have a day job. So it worked out very well. Were there boxers that over the years you also um, looked up to and or that might have even mentored you along the way, Jack? There were, you know, there's a lot of, uh, I, I was a tough kid in the street. And uh, when I got into boxing, I, I, I met Joe Lewis uh, yeah. because, again, I was uh, involved with some people in Jersey and uh, they brought Lewis in to get a governor elected for the vote and stuff, you know, and uh, and he taught me how to throw a jab in the kitchen of a restaurant. Yeah. You know, and we became pretty good friends. And, and Jack Dempsey was a friend and gave me some pretty good advice. And, uh, and Willie Pep was a good friend yeah. uh, and a great fighter. And, uh, and I learned a lot from him. And I had this great uh, old guy as a trainer in Philly and he had like 320 fights. Mm. He's a guy named Gene Johnson, and he was around when Sam Lankford and them were fighting. And yeah, he really taught me quite a bit in reference to because I was big and I was fast. When I was playing ball, I weighed like 280 and ran a four six hundred. Mm -hmm. Move around pretty good. And then when they took me down to like 230 pounds for for fighting, and I was like shaking. I said, "Wow." I wound up being about 35, 40. And, um, but I, I, I was my own worst enemy. I, I had too much talent for my own good because I would take a fight on a week's notice or even a couple days, you know. Uh, and when I – I remember when they, they called me to fight uh, Kenny Norton and, mm. uh, in San Diego. And I said, uh, and I had a lot of indictments against us for union business. And I said, uh, when's the fight? He said, next week. I said, send me a ticket. He said, you'll take the fight? I said, send me a ticket. And uh, I trained about five days for the Norton fight, but I gave him a terrible licking. And I won the town. I stayed in San Diego and uh, became California heavyweight champion. I knocked out a few people, and I fought a guy that nobody wanted to fight, Henry Clark. I took the title away from him. And, you know, I, and I was signed to fight Ali. What we had one time, we had the contracts done and everything. And uh, Norton's people were uh, pretty wealthy people. They took a lot of money and went up to Chicago and gave it to a guy up there. And Ali called me on the phone. He said, I, I'm really sorry, but I, I have no control over this. And so we were good friends, and then we were going to fight in Australia once, and then when I fought, when I beat Al Blue Lewis, who had just beaten, well, he, didn't, he went 13 rounds with Ali, and then he came home and he beat a couple guys, and they were getting him ready for another title fight, and they wanted me to fight him, and, and he was supposed to fight Buster Mathis, and the fight fell out, so they called me on the phone, and, and I said, yeah, man, in a week's notice, I took that fight, and I gave him a terrible beating. And uh, then I went up to see Muhammad up at camp in, in Pennsylvania and said, you know, why don't we get this thing on and, you know, end all this. And, and we, we put on a show. We went into a locker room. We were kicking the door. People thought we were in there fighting and stuff. And he was a comic. I loved him, man. And we come out to sit down at dinner. And he said, if I give you a fight, will you really beat me? And I said, I'll tell you what, or you try to beat me. And I said, for the first time in my career, I'm going to camp like you guys do. And uh, I'll train for a month or so. And when you come in the ring, bring a gun with you because you're going to need it. <laughs> he said, two steaks, please. Yeah. <laughs> he, yeah. he, he was a, I mean, he was he yeah. was a great athlete. He'd have been great in any sport he did. Yeah. He was, he was just a great and And a really good person. When you sat down with Muhammad one-on-one, -on -one, he yeah. was a he was a brilliant guy. Yeah, I liked yeah. him a lot actually. Yeah, and he and that whole uh, thing he had with uh, Howard Cosell and just his humor. Well, he, was like, you know, 
he learned from Gorgeous George, the wrestler. That's right. Gorgeous George told him one time, he said, listen, you want 50% of the people to hate you and 50% to love you, and then you got the whole crowd. That's so right. all of his boisterous rapping and stuff, you know, was to aggravate people. And, uh, and his whole scene with Howard Cassell and all that stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah. He was, uh, but he got my attention, boy. When he fought Norton, he had had a tooth taken out of his head a week before the fight. And Kenny caught him a, an over fluky overhand right, mm. and he cracked the tooth next to where he had the one taken out and it cracked all the way down to the root and the root was wrapped around his jawbone and it cracked his jawbone and he fought that whole fight that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, Freddie Pacheco wanted to stop the fight in the fifth round and Ali said, you stop this fight, you're not going to walk out of this arena. Yeah. And he, and, and I took him to the hospital after the fight. So I know exactly, I saw the x-ray. Mm -hmm. He was, uh, but he, Watching him do that, go through that, I said, you know, you got my vote, kid. And he, uh, yeah, he was a tough guy. He was, he, he, he just, he, he loved boxing and he was very good at it. And, yeah, you know. yeah. But there was a lot of great fighters in that era. Yeah, you know, one of my father's uh, father has, has always said, um, my father grew up in New York and a Brooklyn Dodger fan and the whole thing, and uh, he, he, one of his biggest idols has always been Joe Lewis and especially that very important fight with Max Schmeling and the importance of that almost taking on uh, Hitler in a way and Germany versus the rest. That was a big. Lewis was an interesting guy. I, I, I kind of liked Joe a lot. He, he was, uh, he had very good hands and he was through a lot of good combinations. It was just slow footed. Yeah. He was slow footed. So, I mean, Ali would have beat him. Yeah, but it would have been a great fight. Right. Uh, Lewis, uh, Lewis had a lot of tenacity and a lot of heart, and he could punch. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it's there's certain fighters that, certain styles and different things that uh, work with and against you and stuff. And uh, you know, it's a it's a great sport. You know, and, and when I retired and got into the movie business and I was training all the time, I went back and I took a kid. You what they sent to the Goose and Jim from Detroit, Frankie Lyles, and uh, I made him a super middleweight champ of the world. Mm -hmm. I managed and uh, trained him and, and put together a corner with Freddie Roach. He gave Freddie Roach his first international exposure. Freddie's one of the trainers in boxing today. A great kid. He was a, and he was a good scrappy little fighter. But he's become a great trainer. And so I took one kid and I just made him world champion just to show that I, I knew the ability to do it, you know, and it worked out pretty well. Did you have others coming to you looking for that mentorship and guidance as well over the years, knowing yeah. that I you did. were a boxer? Yeah. yeah. Yep. And I, you know, uh, and I was working out, I used to work out in the gym every day, you know, when I was in the movie business and, um, and I helped Michael Nunn and a few other fighters. And uh, But then I saw this kid. They sent this kid from Detroit. And he was a southpaw, but he was really right-handed. But he boxed southpaw. And, uh, and I liked some of the stuff I saw. And I told him, I said, if you listen to everything I tell you and do as I tell you, in six months' time, I'll make you world champion. And uh, and we did that. I moved him right in my house up on Mulholland Drive. And. I uh, got him in the greatest shape he was ever in his life. And and uh, we put together a great corner with Freddie and two other guys. And, um, and then we went right down the list, one, two, three, four, five, and uh, of the world-ranked fighters, and this kid beat them all. So mm. he, he defended his title for several years. He, he, was, a, he was a good fighter. You know, mm. he's, still, he's, he's a good kid. Absolutely, absolutely. We got uh... – we did a little digging in our research department. We have some really cool shots here. Maybe you can uh, tell us, you know, what the scene was a little bit. And this is part of the boxing career. This is a, a fabulous. That's not me. I don't know who that is. That's not me. Yeah, no. I This is, I think, part of some sort of a series of photos that came together. This one here is another that's one. me and Ken Norton. That's Norton. Yeah, that's the Norton fight. That's uh... – uh, I cut Nick Kenny up pretty. That was a great fight. Actually, yeah. that fight I could have sat on a stool in my ninth round. Really? 
the, the people were standing up on the chairs yelling. It was such a great fight. Yeah. And they rang the bell three times at the end of the ninth round because no one could hear it. Yeah. And the referee finally separated us, and I was going back to my corner. Kenny ran across the ring and hit me behind the head Shh. and drove me into the ring post. And the commissioner, Joey Almas, come up in the corner, and he said, if you can't continue, you just won the fight on a foul. Yeah. I was angry. I said, I'll kill. are you kidding? I'm going to kill this guy. <laughs> and I'm out in the 10th round. I said, what am I doing? I'm in his hometown. It's just, you know, so I knew they were going to steal a decision. But, uh, you know, it, they, but I, the town went crazy over us. So I stayed there and, and, and it worked out very well, you know? Yeah, it obviously did. And here's another. That's Foreman and I. Yeah, yeah. That's George. George, I George Foreman. Punch. I, yeah. Actually, I was beaten in the first couple of rounds, and I, I walked into a punch boy, and, and I, but I got up. And what really made me angry was, I got up, and they 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 stopped the fight very quickly. Mm. And I was not too happy about that, but you know he would never fight me again either. But George and I are good friends. Yeah, George is a good kid. He was a hell of a fighter, and uh, yeah, yeah, really amazing. It's a cool shot too. I mean. <laughs> I don't think. I think that's a Norton fight as well. Oh, that yeah. might be Henry Clark. That could be the Clark fight. I, I don't think I would ever take a parking spot from you, Jack. <laughs> 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 Not with that. <laughs> it's it's a it's an incredible look, um, which you know this wonderful career in boxing again, and then acting. Tell us about that segue. I, How did that happen? I was doing. I, I was in Boston. In Boston, in right? Nineteen. So I went. I, I went to Boston because I was. I started fighting in Philly, and I lived in, in, in an apartment complex with a lot of the Eagles. And Jerry Wallman had bought a shirt and hotel, and we had a club downstairs. So we all worked at the club at night. It was like a day, you know, like a gig, you know. Right. And a rhubarb happened, and it was a big to do. And they got me out of town because they didn't want me in trouble. And, and I was owned by some gangsters, and they figured they put me on a train and sent me to Boston. And uh, so I, and then Steve McQueen came to Boston to do the Thomas Crown affair. Mm -hmm. And we took care of him when he came there, and we looked after him. And Steve and I became very good friends. And he said, you know, Come down on the set. He said, I'll put you in the movie, get you your SAG card, come back to Hollywood. We'll have a great time. And I said, uh, I'm undefeated as a fighter, man. I don't know. I kind of, I think I'll give it a pass. No, what are you crazy? Blah, blah, blah. And he used to call me on the phone all the time. And he, so then I passed on that. And then in 1969, when I knocked out Manuel Ramos, they came to me to do The Great White Hope with James Earl Jones, which was the biggest movie in Hollywood at the time. And they thought the deal was done because Raymond Patriarca wanted me off the street and made a deal with Fox. And they, I just had to go sign a contract. And the guy said, well, you're going to go to Spain for six months. And I said, I just knocked down a guy who's a ranked fighter and I got a shot of fighting Ali now. And you want me to go to Spain? I said, uh, I don't think so. So uh, they, were, they were very, very nervous because of Raymond. And I said, don't worry about it. I'll take care of Raymond. And so I passed. And then when I retired, they came to me to do Farewell, My Lovely with Robert Mitchum. And I went to Hollywood and I did a screen test. And Mitchum said, it's either him or I don't do the movie. And so I blame it all on Robert Mitchum. <laughs> so they wanted you to be a part of it, huh? Yeah. Mitchum, Mitchum was a – and if you were ever going to have a mentor – uh, Mitchum was an amazing mentor. He became like a, we got we were very close and became like a family. Probably the first mistake I ever made in in, in the industry, as far as the industry, is that Johnny Carson wanted me to do his show. Robert had set that up and said, "I'll get you nominated for supporting actor because Farewell Come Out was a very good movie." Yeah. And uh, and I had a shot at the supporting actor nomination, and he said, uh, "You know, I'd like you to come on." So I met him at the Polo Lounge. We discussed it, and and I said to him, "Your show's live, isn't it?" And he said, "Yeah." And I said, "Well," I said, "I don't think I can do your show." He said, well, "What are you talking about?" I said, "Well, I'll come on your show, and you're going to ask me about my father, 
Yeah. And now I'm going to ask you where the men's room's at. And yeah. He said, what? You would get up and leave? And I said, yeah. I said, because I don't talk about Albert and I don't want to, you know, I just don't. And, and I had just come off the streets, you know what I'm saying? So there was a lot of people looking at you from different directions. And, and it was kind of a foolish move. And Mitchum yelled at me the next day. He said, what is wrong with you? He said, don't you understand? Hollywood loves all that stuff. Yeah. I said, you got a big mouth. You told everybody about my life and where I come from. Yeah. And, yeah. He, uh, and he was great. I, Robert was terrific. But, yeah. And he was yeah. right. I should have done the show. Did you stay in touch with Carson over the years after that? Yeah, we talked a few times. And, you know, he uh, he he understood. Yeah. You know, because I, I told him, I said, no disrespect to you, but you're the number one news guy in the in the industry today. Yeah. And you have Albert Anastasia's son on your set, and nobody talked about my father. Right. Uh, I don't know what you know about Albert, but Albert was one of the most feared Italians that ever came in the country and ran a little company called Murder Incorporated. And they, um, when they assassinated him in 57, it's because he wouldn't go in the drug business and he controlled all the harbors. And Genovese wanted to bring the drugs into America and Albert said, we didn't sign up for this, not on our stick. And, they, um, and then when they assassinated him and they came back crying because he was the glue that held everything together. So things really changed after 57 when Albert died. So Now, did you really know him? Was there a relationship you had with no, him? No, I met him once. And uh, he um, and we were about to sit down and, and get into some things. I was getting ready to go up and see him. Yeah. He came down in Jersey and I was getting ready to go see him. And, uh, and, he got, and the assassination happened. Mm. But he left me a lot of written, uh, like a couple hundred pages of stuff. And, and, and I was looked after by Meyer Lansky and Frank Costello and some other people who were pretty smart people. And I listened to Raymond Patriarca and there was only a couple of people I would listen to. And yeah, they, um, and if, I mean, my father was alive. I would have been heavyweight champion of the world. There's no doubt about it. Sure. Right. And if Frankie Carbo was on the street. I would have been heavyweight champion of the world. It would have been yeah. a different. I'd have had a different career because I would have trained. I would have done things differently. Right. And, uh, you know, like I said, it was my own worst enemy. I mean, uh, a lot of fights were decisions that I know I should have won, but you can't train two or three days for a fight. You know, it's just foolishness. You know? mm -hmm. No matter how well you can fight and just because you're a tough kid in the street and stuff, it just doesn't work out that way. So, it right. was a God gift given to me, but the acromegalia was real and it did affect me. And, you know, there were days that I didn't feel like fighting, but I took the fight because I promised to do it. And, and I always kept my word, you know, it's just, uh, it's just the way it was. Mm. Really amazing. I mean, uh, you, you cannot say that you have not had a dull life. I mean, you've had a very <laughs> rich, rich experience in all aspects of life, wouldn't you say, Jack? A little bit. You know, it's uh, we're, we're, we've had a good time. I mean, uh, I love the film industry, and I'm getting ready. I, I tell you, I'm, I'm so psyched because I'm getting ready to – I have a film that I wrote, oh, 40 years ago. Um there was a picture, I don't know if you remember the picture of the informer with Victor McLaughlin and uh, oh, John, yeah. John Ford directed it and it won four Oscars. That's right. And McLaughlin was the first character actor to ever win an Oscar. And he was a fighter. And then, you know, he was a boxer. They made a big deal about it. And, and he, uh, so I, when I got an agent after I did Farewell with My Lovely, and, and they, they said to me, you know, what do you want to do in the business? And I said, told them the type of pictures. I said, I'd like to follow a van like what McLaughlin did. And he said, well, they don't make movies that way anymore. I said, well, I'll redo the informer. So Meyer, Meyer Michigan was my agent. He said, you're not, a, you're not an actor six months, kid, and you're going to be a writer and a producer already. And uh, so <laughs> I, I researched the, the book, the movie, and I met the writer in, in, in London and, sat down with him and he told me where everybody came from and the characters and and I wrote a great script and uh, we've had it for a lot of years and we're getting ready to go to Ireland and do it and uh, mm. and I'm going to do the McLaughlin role so it's uh, we're going to have a lot of fun actually but besides 
we got family legacy we're getting ready to do but i'm only producing that and the studios studio is terrific idea. it's, it's going to work really well so now is that based on the book the family legacy family legacy is based yeah. on the book because there's so many stories that there's so many things that have been told that are not true you know and and how they threw the italians under the bus you know when you go back to the beginning and like when you where your parents lived and there was irish italian neighborhoods there were you know you had the germans the irish the italians you know the jewish people and and they all had different neighborhoods and they all interfaced and um but in the beginning industry government organized crime and unions were all partners for up until the 60s i mean they just worked together and it worked well together and they a lot of the illicit monies that they made from organized crime they put back into the growth of a country they created jobs for people because their primary deal was gambling loan sharking extortion and, and you know if you didn't have money how could you pay them so they made sure you went to work and they created a lot of construction jobs they created they invested in a lot of companies Westinghouse, General Electric, Sears and Roebuck, uh, insurance companies. And it was a different world. You know, it was a, a lot of things were a lot different in those days. And neighborhoods were safer. When I was a kid growing up in Philadelphia, we never locked our front door. People in the summertime, you didn't have air conditioning. People slept out in the backyards. Nobody bothered anybody. Kids played in the street from sun up to sundown. And at six o'clock at night, you better be sitting at your dinner table. You know, and because and the families looked at each other, they knew what each other was up to. It was a different, uh, and, and neighborhoods were looked after. They were taken care of by people, and it was like uh, there were certain people. If you commit, you committed certain incidents in the neighborhood, you had to worry about certain people that looked after the neighborhood more than the law. Let me tell you something. Yeah, right. You know, it was a different, uh, whole different upbringing. Neighbors helped each other. Everybody was, you know jumping across railings, hello, how are you? And, you know, and then the welfare system came in and, they, and the government separated people. And that's when it started mm. in this country, you know? Yeah. And people yeah. didn't have to go to work. Absolutely. Christ that, Christine you know? in uh, North Carolina asks, is there a specific life lesson, Jack, you learned from your boxing days that helped you transition into the career path of acting? Boxing gave me a great timing, you know, uh, which helped me a lot in the, in, the, in the film industry. But again, Robert Mitchum, you know, was, uh, I mean, I, I remember the very first day we ever went to work and he arranged for the car to pick him up and then come pick me up and drive down to the set. And he talked to me the whole time. And, and we got down to the set and got dressed in our monkey suits and went to do the very first shot I ever did in my life. And he looked at me and he said, read that script, kid. I said, read it. Man, I know your role, Charlotte Rampling's role, John Ireland's role. I said, cover to cover. He said, good. Throw it in the trash can. I said, what? He said, don't let me catch you doing what hundreds of people in this business do, acting. Just be yourself. Take this character, put him in you, and walk down the street like you. And, uh, and then he taught me the technical aspects of the camera and movements and stuff. And, and it worked out very well, you know. So I blame Robert Mitchum. You blame my go comes back to Robert Mitchum. Exactly. And, <laughs> then we did King Kong, which was a good film with Jesse Lang was her first movie. How did that happen? How did that offer? How did you uh, get, ta you know, tapped for that one? Well, That's Farewell amazing. was a great movie, and I never read. I never read for a film. They called me on the phone, asked me if I would please come in and talk to me about doing a role. And when I, when I went to do Kong, there was one of five roles I could have done. They told me to take my choice, and uh, so I, I chose Joe Perko, and and yeah. uh, and Jesse and I got close because we had some scenes together and stuff, and. Uh, it just worked out very well, you know, and uh, Kong was Kong was a big movie. Mm -hmm. And then I was doing a picture called March or Die mm -hmm. right after that with Gene Hackman and Catherine Deneuve and Max von Sydow and Lee and Holm, whole bunch, and a kid named Terrence Hill, who was a huge uh, European actor. 
Yes. And uh, and they came to me to do the Bond movies when I was doing March or Die, and I turned the Bond movie down, and uh, and I did March or Die instead, and then from March or Die we went to Superman, and Superman was a long drawn out. Uh, situation and they Hackman and I were down in Spain doing March or Die and they flew us up to London to meet uh, Richard Donner and we discussed the part of Nan mm -hmm. and he asked me you know he said what do you think of doing this guy as a mutant I said I, I actually embraced that I, I like that's what I liked about the script he said are you kidding me I said no I said Jackie Gleason was a friend of mine and he did a picture called Gigo that he won an Oscar for and uh, playing the, the deaf, dumb mute with facial and body expressions and stuff. And I said, if I ever get an opportunity to do that, I'm going to embrace it. And, and when you take the character non and you look at the picture, you know, and Terrence is a vicious general, Sarah is a man eater and somebody had to relate to children because it was a big child audience. So yeah. I said, I'm going to take this big brutish guy and I'm going to play him like a child. You know, learning how to work his eyes and and the giving adulation to Na, to Zod and, uh, and just with child mannerisms. And it worked out very well. That's amazing. Really is amazing. And and then had the opportunity to sort of continue that legacy by being a part of Superman 2 as well. Yeah, well, we actually did one and two together. You know, oh, we you did? Pictures. And, uh, in fact, we had shot so much of two, a Donner had to stop to finish one so they could deliver one. Right. And uh, then when they stupidly got rid of Donner, which is the worst thing they ever did, um, that's why the Donner cut came out 26 years later, because he had shot like 85% of the movie. Mm -hmm. And the Donner cut is much better than the Lester cut. I don't know if you've yeah. ever seen the Donner cut. Yeah. If you have it, you should. Yeah, yeah. It's a much better movie. A much better movie. Um, what was it like being on set with these movies that have sort of become iconic? You know, the King Kongs, the Supermans. I mean, these are... You know, I've been very lucky in my career to work yeah. with some great actors like like Mitchum and uh, Sylvia Miles and uh, Charlotte Rampling and uh, and John Ireland. I think you're there with Mitchum right there, right? With yeah, that's Wild. Robert there. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a Santa Monica Pier. Mm. That's down at the Santa Monica Pier. And that's the, and that's the farewell movie, yeah. Farewell, my lovely, yeah. Mm -hmm. and Robert was, uh, you know, you're talking about a legend, you know? So, yes. Uh, and then I worked to work with Brando. And Brando and I became good friends because he knew my father and I, and I was like a New Yorker to him. And mm -hmm. you know, so that went off very well. And, and, and you had turn stamp as a brilliant English actor. Sarah was young upcoming and you knew she was going to be a great actress. And you had, you know, Jackie Cooper and there were just uh, Gene Hackman. And you were surrounded, so many, by, surrounded you know, by greats. Yeah. Well, and, and the great talent from England that Trevor Howard and, and a lot of great actors that were the judges when they were saying guilty, 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 you know, yeah, and we had, we're on trial. And, and so they did some great people in that film. And then, and I worked with Omar Sharif and Jimmy Coburn. And mm -hmm. uh, I just very fortunate in my career. I've worked with some great actors, Chuck Norris. And uh, it just, it worked out very well. Yeah. Yeah. You really were just so right for these parts. And then also uh, a nice run with uh, Dragnet as well, right? Dragnet was a great film. We had a lot of fun. Dragnet with Danny Aykroyd and Tom Hanks. And that was Tom Hanks' breakout movie. And uh, Danny was just, you. Dragnet's a picture that you could sit and watch 50 times. And you wouldn't get all the one-liners that Danny threw yeah. out. <laughs> you know, he just, he, he was a, a genius of a guy, you know. Did you like being involved? Did you like playing comedy too? Did that come naturally for you? Did you enjoy it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it was very natural. It just, uh, I enjoyed it. I, you know, we had a great time doing it. It was a great film. Yeah. It worked out very well. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. I mean, uh, there you are in these roles here in Dragnet 2 as well, which is cool. 
And yeah, that was the, the, they, when they were they were interrogating me. <laughs> <laughs> How about here? With that, that was a, they. That was the first time I sold. They they were approached me at the marina, and uh, Danny Aqua and I ran over his feet. I was driving the limousine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And this one here, I think, is... That's uh, Hero of the Terror with Chuck Hero. Norris. Yeah, yeah. Tell us about that one. That was a great... That, you know, again, it was another character that uh, that I, I I liked playing that character. It worked out very, very well, actually. And uh, it was a pleasure working with Chuck. And there were a couple other people in the film that were pretty good movie people. And, you know, but the, the problem was it was a, a canon picture and they didn't get behind the distribution of it as well as you would have liked to. But it was one of the best pictures that Chuck ever did as an actor. Yeah. And, and we had a lot of fun doing it. We, it was, uh, I mean, I did it. I'll tell you a funny story. I, I was doing a scene in that movie and my wife from England was with me and she was sitting on a set watching it. And I went up this ramp and I had just got done laughing with her and stuff. And I walked up this ramp and turned around and came down as the character. And when I got, down through the scene, I uh, came back to sit down. She said she was petrified. She said, my God, how do you do that? How can you turn around and become that horrible person like that? And, and she said, you scared me so much. I don't know whether I can sleep with you tonight. <laughs> it worked, out, worked out pretty cool. You know? It worked. <laughs> worked out pretty cool. And so did you sometimes in some of these roles, did you have to call upon some of the uh, boxing acumen for the roles, not that you were boxing in the roles, but just some of the different things and techniques and, and uh, being well, able to be an athlete give you, gives you great timing. You right. Know? I think that the fact of tenaciousness. Yeah. And, uh, and, the, and the timing factor, you know, was, was a big part of helping. And, and acting came very easy to me. You know, I, uh, when I did farewell and I was working about four weeks and, and we had some great people on the crew because of Mitchum, there were four Oscar winners that were on the crew. Dean Talaveras did the set design for The Godfather and won an Oscar. John Alonzo, the cinematographer, was an Oscar winner from Chinatown. Uh, and the, the editor was, a, was an Oscar winner. And I was walking out of Goldwyn's one day after about four weeks of shooting and his office was right by the gate. And he yelled at me, Jack, it's just Jack O'Hara. And I said, yeah, man, what's up? He said, you know, I'm sitting here editing this picture. He said, you never worked before? I said, no, it's the first time out of the box. He said, well, I'm going to tell you something, young man. You're a, you're a star. You're going to be mm -hmm. a big star. He said, uh, you've got a hell of a career in front of you. I said, well, thank you very much. So I go to Mitchum, and I said, I told him what the guy told me, and I said, Maybe I should go to UCLA and take some elocution lessons or take some acting lessons or something of that nature. He laughed like hell. Mm. And he said, uh, stick with me, kid. You'll fart through silk. Don't worry about a thing. He said, you're doing okay. He said, just keep doing what you're doing and it'll all work out. Mm. And uh, and it did, you know. Mm. That's really amazing. I mean, in those early years when you were boxing, did you have a hankering for acting? Did you know that you wanted to go into acting? I liked the industry and yeah. I liked film and I watched a lot of film, you know. Um, and I knew probably one day I would do something in the entertainment world. Uh, just wasn't sure what. Because I also, uh, when I was a kid in Philly growing up, there were a bunch of singing groups. And, and I belonged to a group called Danny and the Juniors, who did At the Hop and, and a few other uh, hit records. And I, I remember I was 14 years old, and I, I went home and told my mother, I said, well, we just got a record contract, so I'm going to be quitting school. She said, guess what? You just quit the music business. You're going, you're going back to school, kid. And anyway, <laughs> so there were two of us, Artis Gattis and another kid, myself, uh, we had to leave the group. Yeah. But, but that's when everybody used to sing on the corners and stuff in Philly and New York, same way. You know, guys, bebops and be on all the corners and stuff, you know, doo wopping. And it was, used to make me laugh because people would be wanting to chase you off the corner because you were making too much noise. But when you cut a record, they want to invite you in the house. <laughs> <laughs> 
Right, exactly. Yeah. All of a sudden, they want to be your best friend, you know? It was a uh, kind of laugh. Absolutely. But, absolutely. And uh, Steve Joyner watching, saying, great interview, Jim and Jack, and they're really enjoying it. And everybody else is thoroughly enjoying it as well. And um, yes, please like, share, follow the Jim Masters show. Uh, we're on YouTube at Jim Masters TV. Subscribe. We're on Facebook, Jim Masters TV, Instagram, Twitter. Um, somebody asked, and it's probably a very difficult thing to answer because there's just certain sensibilities and certain things about each area for you, Jack. Um, what is near and dearer to your heart? If you were to pick acting versus the boxing, or can you not choose because they both had certain uh, times and moments in your life that enriched you? Can you pick one over the other? Somebody asked, it, well, do you like the acting more, the boxing well, more? It, 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 there's no need to do that. I mean, acting, boxing was was a part of my life. Right. Uh, the, uh, and, and it was a day job. I mean, at that time, I was more involved with organized crime. You know, uh, I was what you call a made person when I was 19 years old. And uh, so I had a lot of affiliation with the families and because of my father and stuff like that. So uh, boxing and acting and all that stuff were like day jobs. You know what I mean? Did you ever I, meet uh, Sinatra? Did you ever? Did those, oh, yeah. yeah. Sure, I knew, yeah, I knew Frank. Yeah. yeah. In fact, my father, when Sinatra was in the big band, they and they wanted him to go signal, and Dorsey didn't want to let him go, so my father went and put a gun to his head and said, "Either sign the release or your brains, either your signature or your brains go on the paper." <laughs> and he got Dorsey, Sinatra yeah. out of the contract, yeah. and then he was not happy. He thought Sinatra was a stool pigeon. So, you know, yeah, yeah. Frank, Frank had his own problems. Yeah, he was yeah. a very talented guy. Uh, but the kid, if, if, if Bobby Darren would have lived, you wouldn't have heard of Sinatra so much. Bobby Darren was very good. Yeah. Bobby Darren was a tremendous talent. Yeah, he was yeah. a showman. Yeah, you know, he, and it was very sad to die that young. Yeah, passed away way, a, way, way before his time. Absolutely, a brilliant voice. So also with uh, another one that was really good was uh, from Philadelphia, actually, I believe. And he, and he passed away. I think he actually passed away of a heart attack while at the stove in his kitchen making sauce. Mario Lanza. Uh, Al Martino. Oh, Al Martino. Yeah, he was from Jersey. Yeah. Remember Al Martino? Yeah, yeah, sure, I knew Al well. Yeah. Yeah. Al Martino was a talented guy. Yeah, I know. Uh, Mario Lanza lived in South Philadelphia. That's right. He was a great talent. My God, you don't get much better voice than Mario Lanza. Uh, there were there were just so many talented guys. I mean, singing groups and you know Fabian came out of Philly and uh, Lee Andrews and the Hearts were a big, uh, big time group in the fifties. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there was just uh, Buddy Greco. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. There was a lot of talent that came out of Philly. Um, Jennifer Barry, I think, asks, let's see, I think she had asked, um, how did you like being in the Superman movies? Of course, those are on the tips of people's tongues, the Superman movies. Um, they, you... they, they were great. I mean, and you knew they were going to be iconic. It was Linda. Yeah, Linda asked. Yeah. You knew they were going to be iconic and had a great cast. It was a great director. Uh, Donner was unbelievable as a director, and and you you know, you're working with Marlon Brando, and you're working with, you know, uh, and Marlon and I used to have a lot of laughs, and I, I mean I went down the set one time because I loved watching him work. I, you learn from people like that if you really want to be in the industry and you want to, and you want to do something well, and you're working with with people like that, you can do nothing but learn from them, you know. So I used to get to watch. I'm watching him on the set one day, and he's doing a shot, and something, a noise come up through the camera, which happens, you know. And they said, oh, we got to shut down. With and Marlon said, fix the damn thing. And he turned around, and he said, tell me when you're ready. And he came right back into the set, and he finished the shot. But he had cue cards everywhere. Mm. 
And when he came down off the set, and I sat down while I was sitting next to him, I said, I guess a lot of somebody would be nervous to ask you, but I don't really give a damn. What's with the cue cards? Are you that bored with the <laughs> industry that you got to? He said, no, no. He said, he said I started that with Mutiny on the Bounty, man. He said, uh, I don't want the camera to think that I was up studying the set all that. I said, Marlon. So he sat there and he, and he, and he laughed. And, and he was a great Shakespearean actor. And he sat there and he ripped off a few parables of Shakespeare. And he looked at me and he said, that you must know word for word. This stuff, piece of cake. <laughs> That's a great story. <laughs> he was a great actor. I mean, he uh, he just was a natural. And, and and I worked with and Omar Sharif was the same way. Omar Sharif was a brilliant guy. God, I loved him. And such a great actor. And Jimmy Coburn was a great actor. You know, so I was, like I said, lucky to have worked with some very talented people. Ian Holm. I don't know if you know who Ian Holm is. Ian Holm was a was yeah. a brilliant English actor and, and a great Shakespearean actor. And, you know, Trevor Howard is a great actor. I mean, God, I, I, I sit and think of some of the people that I was lucky enough to have worked with. And then when I did television, I did, a, I did it with a couple of people, very talented, very talented people. You know, I, I did only a few shows because they really like TV that much. But uh, yeah, the ones I did, you know, I, I, Murder, She Wrote. I mean, the lady was an amazing actress. Uh, Angela Lansbury. Angela Lansbury. Oh, yeah. what a, and then what a wonderful woman. God, yeah. yeah, she was a trip. I loved her. Yeah. And Bill Cannon. I did the Cannon show. That was the first TV show I ever did. Oh, I always liked William uh, William Conrad. Yeah, William yeah. Conrad. Yeah. He called me on the phone to do the show, and I said to Mitchum, man, they want me to do this television show. He said, what show? And I said, Can He said, Bill Conrad is a great guy. Go and do the show. Tell him I said hello. I said, are you kidding? He said, no, go and do the show. Tell him I said hello. And he said, you'll learn from him. He's a great, talented guy. And he was right, you know. And I did Freddie Dreyer's show because uh, Freddie was a great ball player. And a good yeah. Player. Yeah. And we did a great show together, you know, and uh, that was it. The Purdy Mason show was a great show. Yeah. Raymond Burr. Raymond Burr was a very, very talented man. And so I, I was very, very lucky. I worked with some very talented people, mm. which helps you, helps you bring something out of you, you know? Yeah. When you, exactly. when you can do characters that people remember everything you've done, then you know you've done your job. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. You know? um, Chris, who is watching in Comber, which is in Northern Ireland uh, near Belfast, is an avid uh, fan and viewer of the show. And we applaud him because in Ireland, it's about 1 a.m. now. <laughs> yeah, um, he says, uh, what did you think of the costume that you wore in Superman in the movies? Was it comfortable to wear? Actually, it was. It was very comfortable. It really was. It was uh, very loose. And uh, yeah, it was, and it was, it was a, a real fine material. So no matter how hot it got on set, you know, and we had some hot sets for it. Uh, you were you were a lot less sweating than you were if you if you weren't wearing it. But when we were outside, like in this shot right here, it was cold, baby. <laughs> in fact, because you see that film, you'll see smoke coming out of our mouth when we're blowing the like we're blowing down the street, turning cars over and stuff like that. So I read my lips are it was cold that night. That was a back lot of Pinewood where we shot that shot. This is on set. This is in Superman 1. When we get, we're on trial. And that's on the back lot of Pinewood. You're perfect for those roles. I mean, you're just perfect for... <laughs> you were it so worked out really, really worked yeah. out well. I mean, uh, yeah. super, I mean, you know, it was great for you. As an actor, Superman made us iconic actor you know yeah you're, you're in an iconic movie yeah that, that people are never going to forget absolutely no matter, in, in every age group i mean i i go today to screening sometimes with children that are like seven eight years old nine years old and they're in awe of the picture because it was done so well we we did no cgi 
you know, we shot Vista Vision on Vista Vision. It Different was, world, uh, yeah. It was brilliant. I mean, there was, uh, the, the, in fact, the technology that they're doing today where you don't have to go on set anymore or a location, we were actually doing that with Superman too. And uh, it was, so, yeah, right. We, we had a good time doing it. And I was very glad the way it turned out. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. It's sad that they, had they kept Donner, Donner would have done three, four, five, and six would have been a different franchise altogether. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I got another cool photo here. It's sort of a, a dual photo. Maybe you can tell us uh, about this. This is a cool shot or two there. That I, I that was a publicity shot where yeah. the hat. Yeah, I did that in Ireland, and the other shot was done in Ireland at my house, and uh, we owned the uh, horse ranch in Dunlavin, had a great 196 acre ranch over there. It was brilliant, actually. Uh, and that was my kick around jacket on the on, walking around. The yeah, farm. good shots, good stuff. Jennifer asks, "Did you know Larry Holmes?" Yeah, I knew Larry well. Larry, Larry's a good fellow. Yeah. Yeah, Larry was from Eden, Pennsylvania. Larry was a good guy. That's right. Tell us about the, you were alluding to it a little bit with, you know, the family history and all, uh, the, and this production that's going to be coming out, the the original book that you penned, which again is riveting and, and really, uh, you know, it's a page turner and that's Family Legacy. Tell us about the book and what it's about and people can get it on Amazon too if they're looking for it. Um, well, you know, we, uh, I have a lot of friends of mine and, and I debated over writing this book because I, there were a lot of people that were still alive that I didn't want them to have to go through any of the hassles and stuff and, because I, I was going to tell the truth about a lot of things. Yeah. And, and that's what we did in this book. We tell the truth about a lot of things that happened. And, you know, and my father being such a powerful man, I seen her and I was there and seeing a lot of things. And I was close to Meyer Lansky and I was close to Charlie Luciano. I was close to Frank Costello and of the old timers that were real people. And I was one of the few people that ever traveled across the country and was introduced to all the Dons across the country. Yeah. Spent time in Chicago with Sam Giancana and uh, Antonio Cardo. Uh, he had a house in Palm Springs. And, you know, and so I, I, they just didn't like, for, here's a good answer. They just did a movie. You see the picture of the Irishman? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's yeah. fallacy. I knew, Frank, I knew Frank very well. Uh, Frank Sheeran was from Philadelphia. He was a driver for Hoffa. Uh, Russell Buffalino was a dear friend. And his nephew was Hoffa's lawyer, Billy. Um, and Russell would turn over in his grave if he saw that movie. And, and Frank Sheeran never killed Hoffa. And he never killed Joey Gallo. He did kill a few people. He was a hitter for certain things. And they did a book called You Paint Houses. Uh, you know, and, and they made, uh, Frank was, uh, huh, like I said, I knew Frank pretty well. And uh, they, uh, it was, Hollywood took a liberty because they always are looking to answer questions that nobody's ever put an answer to. Like, where's Jimmy Hoffa? Or who killed Jimmy Hoffa? Or what happened to Joe Gallo? Uh, how did he die in that restaurant that day? And who was the shooter? The same as who were the shooters when they killed my father in the Park Sheraton Hotel? There's 20 people that took uh, credit for doing something that they, they weren't even there. You know what I'm saying? So we got tired of watching all this stuff. I mean, the Godfather was the closest thing that I ever seen of anything that would, because he wrote what he was told to write. And the Godfather was a combination of four different Dons. One of them being my father, because when Brando was approached about the drug business and he said, if I touch it, my children will touch it, it'd be the downfall of the families. My father said that. Mm. And my father wouldn't touch it. That's why they killed him. They, and they, the night before they were at the park shirt and in a meeting with him, and they were just begging him, Albert, it's only business. There's a lot of money involved. And he said, not a business that I want to be into. I didn't sign up for that business. Right. And, and, and it's going to ruin the families. And, and I don't want any of my children touching it, you know. So it, it was, uh, 
uh, there's just there's a lot of things that need to be put straight. So we're going to do that. So I wrote my book. Uh, it starts with my father's assassination uh, and it goes to Kennedy's assassination. And I tell the truth about the Kennedy assassination, which there is a truth. There's a bunch of conspiracy theories on that, which are all a bunch of junk, you know. So it's time people learn the truth about some things. Um, there was a question that came in from one of the uh, viewers um, in regards, I guess, to Superman. Is there any particular story you're comfortable sharing of the times with Christopher Reeve on set? <laughs> everybody, <laughs> everybody wants, you know, they made this. We had one, listen, you work with somebody for four <laughs> years. Now, you've been in the entertainment business yourself. Yeah, yeah. You're working on a set with a lot of people for four years. There's always going to be an argument somewhere. Sure. You're not going to be in total agreement with anybody 24-7, you know, especially when you're working very close, okay? Now, I always kept my one life away from other lives, although people, I used to tell stories, people would ask me questions and stuff. And there was an Italian restaurant in London, the San Lorenzo on Beach and Place. And I lived down the street, so I used to walk up every night. It was where I had my dinner every night. And it was like my kitchen. And they were dear friends. And it was one of the first Italian restaurants in London. And the food was superb. So I, I touted it to a lot of people at the studio that, you know, they were friends of mine. You've got, you'll love the food. And so it became a very big paparazzi restaurant. And Christopher was in there one night. And he's talking about me and my father and my my mafia connections and and the guy that owns the place is a dear friend so he called me on the phone and he said jack he said how well do you notice christopher reeve kid i said what are you talking about he said well he's in there saying a lot of things i think he's talking out of school mm. he's talking about your father he's talking about you and the mafia and so the next day i went to work and i waited for him to come out on set and i grabbed him and Walked into a little room and we had a very serious conversation. And, and, and I told him, I said, you know, how well do you know me, young man? He said, well, I, I hear all these stories. But I said, well, what gives you the right to go to a restaurant and pontificate things that you don't know what you're talking about? And he's, well, you know, I said, next time you go in a restaurant, you mention my name, you say Mr. in front of it. Do you understand all that? Because if I ever hear you telling stories like that again, then you and I are going to have a problem and you're not going to like it. Yes, yes, okay. So we left. Now we get out in the hallway where all these people are, right? And he started. You can't talk to me that way. Not the I said, well, what did you say? He said, you can't talk to me like that. Like, who do you think you are? So I grabbed him and I put him up against the wall. And I was just ready to whack him, I swear to God. And Richard Donner got up in my ear and he whispered, Jack, not in the face. Don't hit him in the face. So I laughed like hell and dropped them on the floor. And I said, you know, kid, you don't know the past you just got. And I walked away and never talked about it again. You know? Yeah. People had made such a big, people hear that story and they're first, you had a fight with Superman? Oh, my God. You know, but, <laughs> it's, you know, it's just, and it was a, you know, Chris was a young kid. He was young. It was the first big picture he ever did was, was Superman. But I'll tell you something. You'll never get another actor that will do Clark Kent Superman as well as Christopher Reeve did. He did that picture so well, the character. And that's Donner. Donner got a performance out of him that was magic. I mean, going from Clark Kent to Superman, nobody will ever do it like that. And he, and he had the great look. I mean, when he came on the set to to audition for that show. I think he was 170 pounds soaking wet. And when they got the guy from to play Darth Vader to, to work him out, I had a conversation with the guy. I said, you know, don't bulk him up too much because he's got a bit of vanity in him and he won't wear any costume under the costume. So cut him, make him like there was an all Amer a Mr. America guy by the name of Steve Reeves, who was cut perfectly. He like only weighed 190 pounds, and he was Mr. America. I said, build him like that. You know, I said, he's got the body frame. Just pump him out a little bit and cut him. 
And that's what they did. And he fit in the costume and it, it worked extremely well. Mm. You know, and he was, but he, but for, to take the transition from Superman to Clark Kent, you'll never get another actor to do it as well as that kid did. Mm. It's fact, we're talking about bringing back, yeah. we're looking to do another Superman. You know, oh, really? Bringing Christopher back because the technology's there. You can do it, right? Hologram technology. So we're going to bring Christopher, the villains, Hackman, Brando, and we got an amazing storyline that's going to work, I think, very well. We're just in the middle of playing around with it. That's cool. That's fantastic. That's right. Yeah, it's going to be great. I mean, I bet, just ask that question. How is the Superman base out there? How would they love to see Christopher Reeve come and do a Superman movie without all the killing and do it the way we did the originals? You know what I mean? Right, right. That all-American lock them up deal. Don't kill them, lock them up. Right, exactly. Right, exactly. And that's another thing too that uh, you you do. You're you're also a producer as much as an actor and and everything else we've talked about. Uh, how do you like the producing side of all of this? Well, I like it because it's creative. You know, it allows you to be creative. I love putting the pieces together. I like uh, sticking things together and making them work. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> right, 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 exactly. And uh, um, are there other projects that you sort of have, like on your bucket list that you haven't done yet that you would like? Well, when we get into Family Legacy, it's going to yeah. be, we're going to be doing that for a long time. That, that The series will run, the series will make Sopranos and Boardwalk like, like a child's game. So it's so, going to be a series then, right? We'll do a mini series that will turn into a series. There's wow. so much information. When you stop and think of, the opening of a country and then the interfacing with Europe and the interfacing with Asia. You know what I'm saying? And people don't know, like Charlie Luciana yeah. created the OSS, which created the CIA. So as a gangster that was involved in putting that together. Mm -hmm. And when they, there was, when, when, when China, in China in the forties and fifties, white people weren't really allowed over there. So when the CIA was formed, they needed some way to get in there to do certain things. And uh, they used people from Murder, Inc. to go in there and take care of certain business for, for the government. So it was kind of interesting the way things turn around. And uh, there's some great, great stories to be told that are real and they're true. And I had the right to use Meyer's name and everybody's name and you know, and, and to tell the story of how the FBI became as strong as it did and why it did when my father handed them Lewis Lipke in 1939 because Lewis had to turn himself in. He was costing the families a lot of money because the first rat that was ever a known rat, Abe Rellis, was, he put like 11 guys from Murder, Inc. on death row because mm -hmm. he was the first real stool pigeon in the mafia. And, and it was because Lepke should have killed him instead of just giving him a beating. He gave him a beating in a garage one night and scared the death out of him. So the guy ran to the cops and started riding on everybody. And they held him. He was the first guy in witness protection program on Coney Island in a motel. And he got, he was there locked up with police around him 24 seven, right? And he got big and fat. He was only a little guy, but he got roly-poly. And uh, the night before he was supposed to go to court against my father, he went out the window of the motel. And they said, well, he put sheets together and he was trying to climb down the window, but yet he landed 20 feet away from the wall right. <laughs> on the roof below. And he had, and he had policemen around him 24-7. So somebody chucked him out the window. You know? Somebody, Yeah. <laughs> These stories are really incredible. I can see this is going to be some series. I mean, do you, you probably before all of this happened with COVID and everything, you probably were already getting ready to get that rolling, right? Did you have to oh, pause yeah. them? Uh, yeah. I mean, Charlie Luciana's son is my dear friend. He's I mean, between the two of us. And then I've got several friends of mine that are like 80, 90 years old, and they want to tell the truth before they die. Yeah. Of certain things that really happened and why they happened and how they happened. That everybody's, you know, it's like 
I'll tell you a funny story. When I wrote the book, and there's some great reviews on Amazon. It's a yeah. five-star book. Yeah? But one review comes from this old guy from New York who's like 90-some years old. And he, and he wrote, he said, this is one of the greatest reads you'll ever see because it's like more than 70% true. And he said, and, and all the real names are there and everything else, the stories that were in the newspapers every day. And the reason why I know it's true, because I lived it. I was there. He was there. There were so many people the same way. that they're, Think of, of your grandfather and stories that are told in families, but you never see them in the, in the media. You never see them in the ink. No one ever tells the truth about. So when certain things happen, people in your family say, listen, I, I saw that happen. I know, you know, that's the truth. That really is the truth. It's like Jimmy Hoffa was one of the, Jimmy was a man's man. Jimmy Hoffa would never ask you to do something he couldn't do himself. And to blame him, to say that he took $8,000 from a pension fund that he created. There was no pension fund before Hoffa that he created and said that he took 8000 to fix up his house, which is total bogus because if Jimmy's house needed renovating, there are so many carpenters, plumbers that would have done it for nothing for him because they loved him. You understand? So a lot of the stories that are told, that just the truth has to be told. So we, we decided to do that. So is it that um, the stories are sensationalized and more dramatic and focus on negative more and that's what happens and you try to set the record straight as far as Thank why you. people did what they did? The truth about some stuff and, and a lot of people will say, and here's the beauty of that, the audience is from teenagers to 90-year-old people. When I wrote the book, I gave it to four teenagers, high school kids. And they went, two weeks later, they came back to me and they said, my God, how come they don't teach us any of this in, in school? Because of the incidents that I have in the book of things that happened. And they said, why, why don't they? Because they don't. They don't teach you history of, of what really happened in our country, of how the country grew up and everything. They don't tell you the truth about that. They still don't today. All the stuff, look at all the stuff that's in the media today. They don't tell the truth about anything. I mean, they got this, this coronavirus thing. AIDS was a much more killer than coronavirus ever will be. More people died from AIDS and still are dying from it. And, they, and, they've, and they've accomplished medicines for it. But a much more killing disease than this is. And I remember when AIDS first came out, people said, oh, you can't be in a room with that person. Don't, don't shake hands with them. Or if they breathe on you, you're going to go to the doctors right away because you're going to get HIV. And the truth of the matter was you could not catch AIDS unless it's blood on blood. It's the only way you could catch the AIDS virus. And there's no vaccination for any immune system virus. So this stuff that they want to vaccinate people, that's a way of putting a chip in everybody. I don't think so. Not this kid anyway. What are some things, you know, about Hollywood and maybe the industry that you dealt with or that you discovered that really shocked you and surprised you and maybe weren't things that you really, you know, it would surprise people if they knew um, some like behind the scenes, things that maybe you didn't necessarily like about the way things were structured. Was there any time that you had um, incidences oh. where they, Wanted you to do something that you just didn't want to do or that kind of thing? The old studio heads were much more creative. Yeah. And they were there for the long haul. Right. And they had all the land to do what we're going to do now. They could have done this at Universal. Universal had a tremendous amount of property. Warner Brothers had a tremendous, but they built office buildings. You know, they Paramount, Paramount, they all, every year they lose stages in Hollywood. Studios are building like apartment buildings, office buildings. They're going virtual. You understand? Know and there's not even a water body in LA anymore to do a water a water picture. I mean, they built the for Titanic. Jim built that place down in Baja, where they went and did the water shots. But that's closed. So we shot Superman in London because of the 007 stage. 
at a huge stage over there. The last pool that was in in Hollywood was at the Astro William Pool in MGM Studio, the MGM Studio. When we shot King Kong, we did the log scene there. You know, so there's just no water bodies anywhere. There's things that people need to have yeah. in the industry, and they got to go over here. They got to go over there. Yeah. There's always traveling involved and, and right. away from the studio. So to build a place where you can do everything under one roof will make it cost effective. You'll save a fortune in films that you're doing. There'll be so much better attention on them, and there'll be less. In other words, to make, we will have over 120 NC25 soundproof stages. Now, you're in the industry. You know what an NC25 sound sure, stage is? Sure, that's fantastic. How many, you, how many have you ever seen? Right, exactly. Uh, seriously, yourself, Jim. How many have you ever seen? You understand? Zero. And, and because every sound, the truck going down the street, you pick up a vibration, you have to reshoot something again. Right. You understand? Yeah. So somebody's doing an Oscar shot. And the, and the cinematographer says, oops, got to do it again. Because of vibrations or noises. Right. So if you have an NC25 soundproof soundstage, you don't have that problem. It's going to be amazing. All your soundstage is that way. And now you've got, we can build, because of the amount of ground we're going to have, we're going to put... We're going to put uh, sets outside like the old Hollywood did, yeah. little cities, little towns, so that you could do films from $100,000 to $100 million. Everybody will have a home. You won't have to go out on location anywhere. You'll be able to do everything under one roof. Everything will be within a 15-minute walk. It's going to be unbelievable. You understand? Yeah, this is so quite you a... You know something about the industry, so yeah. you understand what I'm talking about. This now, is a mega... There you are housing 30,000 people who are going to be employees of yours 15 minutes from work. No more highways, no more traffic jams. How much tension does that take off of somebody's head? A lot. Yeah. So how much more are they going to pay attention to work when they go to work? Right. You understand? Yeah. And that's what the film industry is all about, about who's paying attention. Because if I'm sitting up in the rafters and you're lighting something and I am not paying attention, they may have to reshoot a shot five times because the lighting wasn't right. That's right. But there was a shadow. But it was this. Or there was oh, that. yeah. I've been yeah. on commercial shoots where it was like 16 hours just for 30-second commercial. <laughs> Bingo. All right? I did a picture... I did a picture uh, uh, with, uh, what's his name, uh, the Flintstones, yeah? Oh, yeah, and, yeah, the Flintstones. And that director was doing 40 takes. My God, 40 takes. You know what that means? He's just shooting, 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 and going into the laboratory and then looking and putting it together there. Yeah, yeah. That's not doing your homework. No. You understand? Yeah. Anybody who shoots more than five or six takes isn't doing his job. Right, right. John Ford, John, I, I used to talk to John Ford all the time, and he was brilliant. He used to shoot rehearsals. He would, he would, people would be doing a rehearsal, and he, they, when the rehearsal was done, they're now they figure they're getting ready to go to do the shot, and John would be moving the camera, and they'd say, Well, wait a minute. We, oh, I just shot it. Don't worry about it. It looks great. Because John knew how to get a performance out of it. Right. And if you're shooting rehearsal, you're more relaxed. So he was getting the performances that he wanted. You understand? What I'm saying? Absolutely. And that's just smart filmmaking. And they these old timers were not only directors, but they were editors at the same time. Mm -hmm. They were like cinematographers, editors. And, and I was so lucky, boy, that I worked around Alonzo and, and, and the camera guy on, on Superman. You're talking about Oscar winners. And you learn how to work the camera. And you learn how to fill the lens. And a lot of problems with the filming today is that they don't shoot master shots well anymore. Right. They're shooting back and forth over your shoulder. Cut this, cut that. It's like very jumpy. You know what I mean? So we're going to do go back old school and change a few things back the way they should be, I think. 
which is going to be a lot of fun. That's going to be amazing. Absolutely. I know what you mean as far as the lack of the the places where there's water to do the water scenes. I was uh, I was on a TV shoot in Burbank in the fall. One of my friends works at Paramount on one of the uh, daily talk shows, Dr. Phil, actually. And uh, he, he took me around the lot and everything. And it was you know, cool to see everything. I had been there before, but it was cool to see some of the updated things. But we were in one of the parking lots and I noticed that the uh, ground in the parking lot at Paramount Studios was painted blue. And then there was just this huge wall, just a big cement wall. It also blue. had blue. And yeah. I said, he said to me, kind of funky that a parking lot would be painted blue on the ground, the concrete, and now just, there's a wall there and it's got the blue and the different shades of blue. He says, you know what happens here? And I said, what? He said, this is where we film the, at Paramount, where we film the water scenes. We have right. all the employees move their cars That's out of the right. parking lot that's and we right. fill it with water, the parking lot that's with right. water. That's and then right. that's where we do. This, that's, this exactly, that's exactly true. And it's, it's the water's only like a couple of feet deep. It's terrible, man. It's, and it looks like it's uh, the fierce Atlantic or something. Oh yeah. No, they, that's exactly true. <laughs> we shot, we, we, we did, uh, uh, we shot King Kong out of Paramount. But we shot most of it at MGM. Yeah. And and like the the great wall scene, you know that yeah. big wall? Yeah. That was on the back lot of MGM. And they you had to stop shooting at night at a certain time. And they had all these guys dressed in costume running down <laughs> running down the street at like two o'clock in the morning. They were all smoking grass and stuff. And they're dressed in their grass dirts. Yeah. And they're kind of got spears and they're running. <laughs> Over City Boulevard, man. Oh my God. What pandemonium it was. Oh, geez. So you'll have that all solved in Nevada with everything you're building. Everything. Everything. Yeah. Can you imagine now? Imagine being on a shoot where you're walking 15 feet over to an editing room. That's you know unheard of. That's unheard you're of. Walking. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you got 15 feet to walk over to an editing room. 15 feet to walk over to a sound place, 15 feet to walk, or any technology you're looking for. Mm. It's right there at your fingertips. So is it going to be in Vegas or somewhere else? In, right outside, in a place called Apex. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right outside. It's about 50. It's what they call North Vegas. Right, right. They call North Vegas. Yeah. We got 2,000 acres there. Do you really? Wow. Yeah, it's good. making a deal with the school, the University of Nevada. And what we're going to do is that the university, you know, for all the people at the school that are involved in the industry in any manner, be it technical, be it acting, whatever, they will all have internships on our lot. And every hour they do as an intern will go towards your union card. So by the time they graduate from school, they're full-fledged union members. What a terrific idea. What a great way to foster and, uh, you know, learning and to, to mentor young minds and give them some real yeah, hands projects. on. Hands Their on. projects will allow them to do on the, sta on the stage. You know, we'll bring them over and give them a sound stage to do on any school projects they have. You know what I'm saying? So you're creating. Yeah. You know, it's really amazing, Jack, when you think about it, how your life really has been full circle because when you were boxing you were hands-on and now you're going to be hands-on with this mega place in nevada uh, inspiring young minds so they can be hands-on it's full circle yeah. <laughs> i have a great partner a guy named jay Simon, mm. who was who ran part of, of uh, mgm and he started out at universal when he was a kid and in fact, he brought the game board stuff to the Universal. Oh, Very really? A technical guy. He looked up a guy named Jay Samet. What a mm. resume he's got. Yeah, yeah. Really brilliant guy. And he mm. loves the film industry. And it was just, you know, to put together a team of people that you don't have to look over your shoulder with, you know, and, and do it to where you're staging it with age groups so it's passed down properly. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, when, how long ago... 
were you and the team thinking of this idea and did it result from being frustrated with not having the resources and a facility that you needed in, in New York or, or LA? That yeah, we started, we started in 206, 207 and we, and we found a place in Long Beach that was yeah. perfect. Yeah. It was a building that was a million square foot and it, the, the concrete was so thick because planes had to ride over it. You understand? Mm -hmm. So to make it NC-25 was easy. Yeah. We had a depth of soundproofing. Then we would have put a vacuum floor in on top of it and soundproofed everything out. And we would have had 40 stages, which mm -hmm. nobody had 40 NC-25 stages. And we were putting a building in with a water body with a little island, like you could do tropical things and different sets and stuff, you know. And we, and we had one of the best updated uh data centers that was terrific and it was real time it's hard to find you know yeah. where it's on the second not 30 second delay or anything right so it was uh and and you need the power to do that and, and, and la was a i mean long beach was a great place because the port was right there so there was a lot of energy and there was a bit of power station right next to us and it was it was great so mm -hmm. Well, we can do that in Nevada, and uh, just to put everything under one roof is going to be so phenomenal for the industry. Mm. So you're doing television streaming and stuff like that. It'll be the same studio. So all the talent that you're looking for, you'll be banging into. You understand what I'm saying? It's going to be a home away from home for entertainers. Can you reserve a spot for me, Jack? <laughs> I'll get on the plane quick. I'll be right there. <laughs> I got the chops. I got the chops. Well, you know what I'm saying, though? Yeah. You're, right. you're in the industry, so you understand yeah. what I'm talking about. Absolutely. And it's yeah. going to be uh, it's going to be such a – it'll be a home away from home for everybody. But to be able to only have to travel 15 minutes to work, it means you have hours in the day with your family. You understand? And it's just, it's going to be great. I, really think, be great. I think we're looking at the new Walt Disney here <laughs> with the visionary ideas. This is really cool. It's really, if this is also, uh, this is, well, you have several already, but I mean, this is really legacy building, legacy created, creating. This is going to be just another thing that is part of Jack's uh, extraordinary legacy. Of, of it's something that's needed. It's something that's been needed for a long time. Yeah. You know, I mean, you're doing, here you are doing a, a multi-million dollar picture at Warner Brothers or Universal. And there's one little technical aspect that isn't there, but some shop in Hollywood can do it for you. And you got to travel all the way across the town. And now you got a Teamster driver. And you got, and it's cost, not very cost effective. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. If it takes a guy seven hours to go there and get back because of traffic and everything else, and and you're holding something up, it's it's not good. So we're going to yeah. eliminate all that. It's going to be like a one-stop shop, huh? One stop shop. It'll be like a huge bar mitzvah hall. Everybody that walks on that lot pays us. <laughs> That's it. Have you broken ground already? Or we're about to? We if we, if it wasn't for this. Wasn't for what's going on, and out there the beauty of it, we're going to build it out of industrial hemp, which is an amazing building material. Wow! Unbelievable building material. So we'll build it in a couple of years, easy, because it's very quick. Mm. Industrial hemp is the future of building. I can build, I can build a two-bedroom, two-bath home. Yeah. With all the inlaid furniture, inlaid tiles, all made out of hemp, I can build that whole house in two weeks' time for twenty wow. grand. So, what is it that it just binds well, sticks together, strong? Yeah, it's just it's stronger than concrete. They they did a test on the wall in France, where they hit a concrete wall and a and a hemp wall with six thousand BTUs of heat for an hour. The, the, the concrete crumbled and the hemp only had a singe mark on it. So it's waterproof, fireproof. We know if you build houses with it, they'll never burn. 
and there's no moisture, no, it absorbs all the moisture. So you got no mold, no mildew. And here's the beauty. The temperature inside the house stays at 69 to 72 continues. Not too shabby. Not at all. That's got these magical I can build, uh, I can build a 30 story building without one drop of steel. So you have less accidents, you're building faster, you're building safer and secure. Sounds like it's better for the environment too. Oh, absolutely. People don't, if you go on Amazon, there's 2,000 products made out of hemp today. Mm. Makeup, right. all kinds of things. Makeup, food products. All, can you go back and watch all the Indian movies, yeah? Mm -hmm. and, they, and all their clothes were made out of hemp. And you wondered how they lived in these snow-bearing places in teepees because those teepees were made out of hemp. That's right. I... And they had one little fire in there that kept them warm. Nobody froze to death. Mm. Really cool. It's, it's revolutionary as well. <laughs> kind of so, neat, huh? It really, really is. I mean, it's very, very cool. Is it going to take up most of the 2,000 acres or just portions of it? Well, portions of it. We're yeah. going to, you know, we're, like I said, we'll put sets outside like they had in old Hollywood. So you won't have to go traveling anywhere. We're going to put a hotel. No, no, no RVs are going to be on the lot because we're going to have a hotel where everybody stays. Mm. And you just walk right over to work. So you got suites for everybody. And rooms for other people, so there's no. And we'll put we'll put a uh, a health place in there for people that need to come and lose weight or get ready for shooting. Great idea. You know, be a gym, a health center, uh, to get people on the proper diet and everything. Yeah. So we're covering every single base that you can think of to help straighten people out to get them ready to go to work, and to take all the stress and tension off their head. I imagine uh, a lot of people are going to want to move to that area too, oh, from yeah. other parts of the world and the country. Yep. Yeah. We'll have, and then here's a kicker now. I love this. We're going to put a 45% tax deal in over there. And the way we're doing it, it isn't on taking it from the state's budget. We're going to do what they call a tax rateable deal, where what money we bring in, we have a portion of the taxation of it. So imagine being a production company, getting a 45% tax deal. They'll come from all over the world to come there. They will. They absolutely will. The studio won't be big enough day one to handle all the traffic that they're going to be banging on the door to do productions there. Is there an estimate as far as, uh, you know, from groundbreaking to when you and the team hope to have it finished? Two years. Wow. They're going to move quick. That's yep. fantastic. So everything is really in place as far as the team, the people. The, the team, everything's ready to go. Just got to get past this Mickey Mouse stuff that's going on right now, you know, and then put everybody out there to work and you put double teams in. So you're working 24 hours right around the clock. And this stuff pours, you know, one of the beauty of it is it pours like concrete and it takes, and, and it, it pours and a day and a half later, you move the frames because it's already set. So you're just constantly moving. You're not mm. waiting a week or two weeks or like concrete stuff and all that stuff. It's brilliant. Brilliant to work with. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, we do rebarb, we just put a form down and pour the form out, let it dry. And now you got rebarb. That's stronger than steel mm. and lighter. All right. Mary Bishop here saying, great vision you have, Jack. Great vision to have to put this all together. It's uh, this is very exciting. It's really, really when you know, you know, a lot of things are sort of uh, contracting to have this incredible idea to bring things back. I think we need more of that. I think we need a little bit more of uh, an understanding of the way things, how they were done. Oh, they should have been continued to be done too. Yeah, yeah. and it, it all stopped. Bottom line, the buck. 
Is that what it? You got MBAs running the industry. They don't have any creativity. You got guys coming in for three years, taking a lot of money and leaving. Bean counter. Yeah. Nobody's, nobody's, nobody. And you got, you know, here's a good thing. You, okay. You have places like North Carolina, Georgia, Florida, where they're doing tax deals. And everybody runs there. But what they don't understand is there's not that many technicians there. And you have to do a lot of film to make a studio work. So you're, you're, you're starting, you've, you've got to fly people in now. You've got to fly them in, house them, feed them. There's your tax deal already being eaten up. So if you have a problem with the script, they're tearing pages out of the script rather than put money where it's supposed to be. Which yeah. Eliminate that, man. Which doesn't make sense. Exactly right. That's exactly. Why there's so many lousy movies being made. Yeah. Well, you yeah. see a film, you see a shot that, see, if you're in the industry, you watch a shot, you say, wait a minute, something missing here. You see the mistakes. Oh, yeah. They, they didn't cover that because they didn't have the footage to cut it, to cover it. Right. They tore yeah. a page out of a script. Or the dialogue isn't totally flowing the way it's supposed to. Well, they figured they were going to go over budget, so they just rushed it through and finished it. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> which happens a lot. Which exactly. happens a lot. Oh, yeah. And then the quality too, just of the, the, the storyline and you know yeah. what it is. A lot of things today don't have any meat to them. It's just you know, bam, bam. No creativity, my friend. You have guys 20 years old reading scripts for studio. You know what we did? Uh, this is naughty. We did this about 10 years ago just to prove a point. We took the script from Casablanca. Changed the name on it, changed a few things inside of it that would make it not be Cavs of Blue, and we submitted it to all four studios, and all four turned it down. Oscar winning movie. All four studios turned it down. Why do you think that was? Because they got kids reading scripts, don't know what they're reading. And didn't even probably know what Casablanca even was originally. Oh, well, we didn't say no. We didn't use the word Casablanca. Ah. I mean, we took that out of it. So we they just just used the storyline. Didn't have enough an Oscar-winning picture. Yeah, didn't have enough explosions and visual effects and all that. You know, we yeah didn't it just they, <laughs> kids don't know what they're reading. You know how many I, scripts? That's why so many independent pictures are being made today. I, um, we had some friends over, this was maybe two years ago. And, um, you know, I like all the classics too. And the movie that we were watching that was coming on television, uh, one of the people in the crowd was, now it's a, one of those movies where there isn't a lot of flash and bing, bang, boom and action and visual. It's more about the storyline and the actors and the facial expressions and the camera movements and, and the music slowly sweeping in and, and the, the content, the, the body of the story, the moral of the story, the theme of the story. And that one particular person had said, God, this is so slow. And we're like, why are you saying this movie that we're watching, which is uh, an epic movie, the storyline is perfect. And it's, it was actually a, uh, you know, a revolutionary groundbreaking movie for its time. You're not listening to what they're saying. You're not looking at their expressions. You're not listening to the, the music perfectly comes in and, and this, the shots and the lighting, you're not, being swept away by the feeling and depth and warmth of this movie. It's, it's just, there's not enough like quick cuts and visual and cars blowing up and everything else. And they said, yeah, you know what the movie was that wasn't fast enough for that friend? Guess who's coming to dinner with Catherine Hepburn, Spencer Tracy <laughs> and Sidney Poitier. They thought it was too slow. <laughs> Could you imagine that? <laughs> Guess who's coming to dinner? I mean, there was a whole buildup. Oh, an Oscar-winning movie, boy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, you know, 
Sydney <laughs> Poitier, Catherine Hepburn, Spencer Tracy, the whole, Isabel Sanford was in it. I mean, that wasn't going to be Flash and Dash. I mean, they I were. Know, they, it? they were. They they needed like an instant gratification. They needed more like action and faster camera movements and everything. Where I'm the opposite. I like to get into. You know, oh, yeah, take, developing your story, yeah. Sweep me away and draw me in, and then you've got me through the whole, you know, picture. Uh, I just thought that was funny. You've probably been in rooms many times where there's one person in the room that says something like that, like, God, does this thing go on forever or what? You know. People don't appreciate, uh, don't appreciate good talent, you know. And, I love uh, watching old movies because of the talent, just the pure talent. The talent and the writing too, the the storyline and the you know even even the music in a movie yeah. obviously can really make absolutely yeah make or break absolutely yeah. yeah. You know, Jack, when you look at your body of work, when you you look at all of this extraordinary, as I said, you really are a. Uh, living legend and national treasure in so many different ways. And you've touched, you know what it is about you, Jack, you're a regular guy, you're an authentic person. You, you know, you remember Philly and New Jersey and Boston and all these great places and everywhere you've been, you've uh, absorbed aspects of those places that have just enriched the person that you are, you know, coming from the streets, having that uh, street sense, but then also having the uh, dramatic, opportunities as a brilliant actor and also having a real understanding of people, the human condition, also an understanding of business. I mean, you really have it all. And uh, starting with this incredible career, you know, in boxing and then having it led to the incredible career as an actor and, uh, and then getting into the production side and the business side of it all. It really is, you know, a complete full circle experience. When you look at all of this, do you ever sort of pinch yourself and say, wow, it's, you know, it's, a, it's, it's been a long way from uh, Philly and Jersey, but yet Jersey and Philly are still in you. It's, they're still part of who you are. But boy, it's like, uh, you know, local guy made good and he, he started out you know, doing whatever he could to do that day job and then just really built an incredible career. And then through all of that, wants to give back in the way that you are with this incredible facility that's going to be built in uh, Nevada. Do you ever look back at it all and say, wow, is, is this me? I, I've been living this life. I mean, uh, it's, it's really cool and it's very uh, inspiring to others, Jack. And it's, uh, it's quite a story. It really is quite a story. You have touched people in so many different levels and all different generations and backgrounds. And it's cool stuff, Jack. You ever pinch yourself and say, wow, this is something else? I just, you know, I, um, I just like putting one foot in front of the other and just, you know, just, uh, I don't, I don't, cry over spilt milk just fix it you know if you're doing something that needs fixing then just do it and fix tracy reiner you know who that is that's 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 uh what you call his daughter rob yeah rob, rob reiner's daughter. daughter yeah yeah her mother's did the uh, the show what's her name uh, <laughs> she's a sweetheart and of she course, really, her grandfather. She's very talented. She's done some pictures of her own self. She's a very talented kid. Welcome, Tracy. You've come from a legacy of incredible talent. Of course, we're she's still, a sweetheart. She really is. Boy. We're still celebrating the uh, extraordinary Carl, her grandfather, um, who was. Uh, I think somebody said something recently, and I think it was Carl and maybe Mel Brooks and Dick Van Dyke and Norman Lear. They were all together, and I, I've loved all of them working in television as I do and everything. Um, those four people and, and Rob as well too, you put yeah. them together and that's decades of comedy. Norman Lear, Carl Reiner, you know, oh, yeah. like Mel Brooks, Rob. Absolutely. Well, you know, oh, yeah. They have touched 
generations with comedy that still stands the test of time, which I think is that's legacy building, like what you've done with your career as well. Um, thanks, but yeah. <laughs> Did you just tune in late? <laughs> What? Tracy's crazy's great. She's a She's sweetheart. Funny, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, um, you know, when you look at all of that, for you, it is really an incredible and illustrious career, and just absolutely groundbreaking stuff that you've been involved in. Everything you've done is groundbreaking, and that's what you're doing with the new facility in Nevada too, Jack, which is amazing. I just something that needs to be done. You know, it's something that should have been done years ago. It's just, you got to look at people and, uh, and help ease up the pain that keeps, you know, when we were building the one in, in Long Beach and the guy, the guys from the union came to me and said, please get it done, Jack, please get it done. Cause they were, they were getting divorced. They were going to Louisiana to work. They were going to Georgia to work and they're separated from their families, you know? For periods of time, and that's tough. Absolutely. Tracy says, I love this man. He's a library of information and experience. <laughs> XO. She might have just joined us late. We've actually been on for two hours, Tracy. <laughs> <laughs> We've had an incredible conversation going back in time for about two hours, which is extraordinary. Jack, you really are amazing. And uh, is there anything, you know, that you haven't done yet other than this f phenomenal project you're going to be embarking on in uh, Nevada? We wish you great success with that. And I can't wait to come visit it. Uh, any other things just individually that you still want to do that, you know, it's sort of on that Jack bucket list? I just want to finish writing the books that we want to get all the history done and, you know, and probably do a bunch of tapes for, if I'm not around anymore, it'll keep on going, you know, for next generation. Stuff. Yeah. It's just a lot of stories that need to be told. And I think right. a lot of things that people, truth that people should be told. Absolutely. And I'm a believer. Of that. Good comments coming in here. Again, we have this worldwide audience. We have folks that are so expressive. Thank you for the interesting conversation, Jack. It brought me closer to my dad, who was her daughter, that's uh, Francis, misses our time together, sends me strength to move forward every day. Sat with my dad five years straight every weekend. Your sort of some of the stories and some of the tales are uh, of your experiences are making her feel sort of reconnected with her father again, which is, again, you never know the lives you touch with the work we do, right, Jack? That's correct. That's absolutely true. It's beautiful stuff. It's beautiful stuff. Jack, thanks so much for joining us here tonight. You were absolutely amazing. And do you still have that glass of water? Because we're going to do a toast. We do. <laughs> yeah, we like to do a toast with all of our guests. Here we go, my friend. Slancha, Slancha my friend. <laughs> Slancha. This, was, this was epic. Two hours, two hours and four minutes of a phenomenal and extended conversation. And, and I don't like to rush anything. I, I really like to have a good get to the core conversation with my guests, uh, with this show and then my professional work in television and radio. We wish you all the best. Continue hey, blessing. Same to you. I'm glad your audience liked it. And, they did. You know, yeah. You we'll, were, we'll, we'll do it again someday. You're welcome back anytime. And I hope to uh, see you soon and maybe break bread and pour some real wine together. That would be amazing, Jack. Be well, my friend. Take care. You take care. Thanks for all the time. Thank yeah. you. You have a good night. Take care. You too. Bye-bye right. now. Extraordinary conversation with an extraordinary individual and truly, as I said, a, uh, a true treasure. Uh, actor, former heavyweight boxer, producer. His stories are so amazing. And what I love is his authenticity. Uh, we just did a two-hour ad hoc, ad lib conversation and he really rolled with some extraordinary uh, expressions of, of love and uh, talent and experience. Um, he's really amazing, isn't he? Uh, born in Philly, raised in Jersey, and then he went up to Boston, and then that incredible boxing career as well. If you just joined us late, uh, we've been here since 7 p.m. Pacific. It's now 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. It's now 9.08 p.m with our exclusive and illustrious and wonderful guest, uh, 
Jack O'Halloran. Really, really cool. It was a blessing to have him on the show. We've been planning this for a long time and we'll have him back. He, you know, he's welcome back on the show anytime. And we say that to all the guests as well, but uh, we'll go through a couple of those pictures again too, in case you, uh, you missed any of it. Uh, really cool stuff that we sort of dug up and we were talking about all of these different shots uh, along the way. And I love how open he is. You know what I mean? He's a straight shooter and that's refreshing. You don't always get a lot of that these days. He's authentic. He's a straight shooter. He tells it like it is and um, really cool guy. And if you've always been a fan of his and you've seen him do a lot of different things over the years in different roles, now you got a deeper essence and sense of who he is. And that's what I like to do. And that's what I've done professionally for many years on television uh, for networks and stations and all my radio career and everything else. I work with public television and everywhere else. Um, I like to get to the core. I like to really learn about a person, what motivates them, what makes them tick. And again, he's had uh, so many incredible experiences. You know, it's like he's lived several lifetimes through his body of work and all the things he's been involved in, including that he got into the family history as well as father and some of that uh, really cool, interesting uh, background. There's with Robert Mitchum as well. That was really a cool movie. He's been in some incredible productions and uh, this is a great shot. We were talking about that. Like I was saying, I don't think you'd want to take a parking spot away from Jack in that shot. Superman, Superman two and, and so many others, King Kong, cool stuff. And you know, he's uh, he realizes the blessings. He, he just uh, realizes how lucky he's been. And um, and that's what's cool. And again, in the book as well, this book is unbelievable. It's really, really a page turner. Very, you're gonna love it. And he's working on two more books. As we mentioned, he's gonna be turning this family legacy into he's working on a mini series that's very cool he just shared with uh, us tonight that news and in addition uh two more books and then also this you know mega facility uh that brings back some of the old school hollywood way uh that's being going to be constructed in nevada can't wait to go out and uh, check that out once uh, it's done and they're going to move quickly on that he said that's going to be in two years time this mega studio facility is going to be completed so he's got the crew everybody's in place and that's really exciting good stuff good stuff hope you guys enjoyed it again uh, this is an entertainment lifestyle talk show series we are well over 100 plus episodes you guys know i do television and radio and all of this uh, professionally so glad i created this show 15 weeks ago so many people around the world have been uh, following us and enjoying all these great conversations. And when we don't have guests, we do viewer interaction. We go, we go on location. We talk about just about everything, life, food, health and wellness, Hollywood, Broadway, television, music, all kinds of cool stuff. And uh, knowing you guys are out there and enjoying it just is a true blessing for me. Um, this project that we're doing here, the Gym Master Show Live is uh, there's a lot of work behind the scenes to put it all together, coming from the home studio and everything, and uh, balancing it with the professional work that I do. But I love doing it and the fact that you guys are here. So we thank, once again, our very special guest. And for this uh, epic two-hour conversation exclusively here on the Gym Master Show Live, uh, there were times where I just let him roll and he just shared some gems with us. And that was a blessing and uh, welcome all the new people that were watching today and all the regular loveties as we call all of you for joining us here extraordinary guest jack o'halloran if you'd like to see this again or share the episode it's available on our youtube channel at gym masters tv let's take a look at some of these great comments coming in here i was so relaxed tonight i feel like i'm home irish and italian slancha and saluta <laughs> You also felt like you uh, was hearing the way your dad or grandparents style of storytelling was. And, and I love all that. That's why I let Jack roll, you know, in extended periods because just letting him tell those stories. I love that, you know, interject little 
flavor here and keep the train on the tracks. But uh, I've interviewed over 6,000 people in my work in television and radio and an honor to interview Jack tonight. I don't even call these interviews. I call it a conversation. It's really a conversation. So it was like we, we were pouring wine and breaking bread and two friends were chatting. That's the kind of warmth and atmosphere I like to create in everything that I do. Well, you guys know that. You've been following this show and some of you follow me on my other work on uh, television and radio and stage over the years. Fascinating conversation. Thank you very much. And Chris, still watching in Northern Ireland, great actor and human being. What a life he's had. Really cool, isn't it, Chris? And uh, thanks for staying up there in beautiful the Emerald Isle as it's uh, late night where you are. You're a trooper, Chris, and so happy to have you here following along with all our great shows. Jack is so cool. He seems so down to earth, honest. Yeah, he certainly is. Jennifer in uh, Iowa, we are glad you created the show and everyone is interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And Chris uh, in Northern Ireland says, I hope you have a great weekend, Jim. Stay safe, my friend. You too. You too. And I want to let you guys know tomorrow night we have another amazing guest and another television and movie legend. This is Suze Lanier. She was in the movie. The Hills Have Eyes. Yes, we're going to talk about that. She was also in a lot of television shows too, uh, Three's Company and Welcome Back, Cotter, and so many others. She's all excited. She's going to be here tomorrow exclusively, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, live with me here on the Gym Masters Show. And then on Sunday, dear friend, I've interviewed him a ton of times, multitude of times on my work as a host on public television. This is uh, Ryan Kelly from Celtic Thunder. Yes, that very popular Irish singing and vocal group, Celtic Thunder. He's also a part of Byrne and Kelly, which is the duo with Neil Byrne, who's also from Celtic Thunder. And Ryan has a brilliant solo career. I've interviewed him so many times on uh, PBS over the years. He's a great guy, he's a great talent. He's all excited to be here. And he's here this Sunday night, exclusively here on the Gym Master Show Live. And then I want to let you know as well, the following week on the 30th, Neil Byrne from Celtic Thunder is going to be here. And then on September 6th, Paul Byram, very popular singer, also hails from Ireland. Uh, many specials on public television. I've interviewed him multiple times. He was also with Celtic Thunder. He's going to be here on September 6th. And, and, and I have something exciting I'm going to announce right now. Remember I was telling you that we're going to have on the show exclusively members from the Temptations, the Four Tops, and the Platters on our show. Guess what? Everything was solidified today. Uh, this was something that was brought to my attention. So excited, so excited about it. They are going to be here. They have a phenomenal group called the Voices of Classic Soul. It's a phenomenal group where some of the folks from the Temptations, Otters, Four Tops are together, and they've created the Voices of Classic Soul and all that great music that has stood the test of time. They are going to be here on my birthday. It's turned out, once I guess they heard uh, that it was my birthday, they said, let's do it on Jim's birthday. So they're going to be here live. I'm sure they're going to perform on my birthday, which is September 24th. So on September 24th, it's going to be an extraordinary night. It's going to be a very cool night. We just, this is hot off the presses. We just got the confirmation from the... Uh, team we're working with who said that uh, the voices of classic soul are going to be here and uh, that's folks uh, from the temptations the platters and the four tops they're going to be here and i did say hey you know um, i didn't we didn't book anybody for my birthday because i figured maybe we'd just do like a birthday show and chat with you guys and have a cake and maybe family on and whatever <clears throat> and then i said well you know it'd be kind of cool if if this group could be on <clears throat> that same day and everybody worked it out and they're going to be here on the 24th. 
That's amazing. That's going to be some night. That is uh, September 24th. If you're watching this show in the archives after the 24th of September, then you can find that episode and all these episodes in the archives on YouTube at Jim Masters TV. And give it a subscribe as well. So many guests coming up, really extraordinary people, and not just guests. I'm going to do a pop up show as well tomorrow. So look for the announcement on Facebook. We're going to do it in the afternoon and we're going to do it on YouTube. So make sure you check us out on YouTube. Uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel. We're going to do a pop up tomorrow. I think it's going to be about 1 p.m. Eastern. It's going to be 1 p.m. Eastern. We're going to do a special pop-up show. It'll be on YouTube. If you haven't visited our YouTube channel, it's a promotion we're doing with YouTube. Um, just go to YouTube and go to Gym Masters TV and click subscribe. And uh, I think it sets you all up so you can even do comments if you want as well. And we'll do a quick, it'll be a quick one. Mm. I always say that and it goes long, right? Because we have such a good time together. But we're going to do a pop-up show. That's tomorrow, Saturday, 1 p.m. Eastern. So I hope you're here. If not, we'll be here tomorrow night as well, 7 p.m. Eastern and uh, 4 Pacific with Susan Lanier, the brilliant movie and television actress um, who's going to be here tomorrow. Again, this is uh, Suze. Once again, she'll be here tomorrow. One more thank you to our amazing guest, Jack O'Halloran. He was absolutely incredible. We appreciate all the time. Also, I'm going to take a look at some wonderful comments, you guys, here, too. We still have a few more minutes before we wrap. I want to show you this picture that was sent to me last night from one of our viewers, Allison Tillman. Remember last night, um, I had the um, psychic medium on, good friend Artie Hoffman. Well, Allison was watching, and she was posting on the Facebook page of Gym Masters TV. She noticed that we have, you know, the cast of characters here on the show. We have... Gilligan, the official Gilligan doll, Bob Denver doll, who was sent to me personally uh, by Bob's wife, Dream of Denver, uh, which was a beautiful gift. She wanted him to be a part of our set. So he's here. Pretty cool. And of course, George Burns is here as well. And then the genie bottle. And of course, Silver and Jimmy are here. But the genie bottle. And Allison fell in love with the genie bottle. So she kind of put something together. She sent me a photo late last night and posted it on the Facebook page. And I really appreciate her doing that. That was really cool. This is beautiful. I don't know if I really have shown this bottle up close. It's, it's a beautiful bottle, isn't it? Yeah, you see it. It's the uh, authentic replica of the Audrey Magini bottle. And this was, uh, this was given as a gift. And if you remember, I mentioned that uh, the folks uh, that created I Dream of Genie patterned the original I Dream of Genie bottle after the prototype was actually a uh, Jim Beam liquor bottle. Yeah, they sort of designed the shape of the I Dream of Genie bottle from that. So Allison Tillman, one of our faithful viewers, who actually has been following me for years, I think she first saw me on public television, so she's been following me. <clears throat> and then when we created this show, she hopped aboard as a viewer. She sent me this really cool picture that she made. Um, she combined a picture and then she screen captured two pictures from last night, which I thought was cool. If you may remember, we were celebrating uh, National Radio Day here in the United States. So I've worked in radio for years and we had posted some pictures from the radio days. So Allison sent this and I wanted to share it with you. Now, if you look, you see the genie bottle, you see inside the genie bottle, of course, that's the couches and the beads and everything. And in the upper right, she's got a still shot, screenshot capture of me from last night's show when our guest Artie Hoffman was on. And then in the left-hand corner, you have a shot that we showed of the very first time I was on the radio professionally, which was on WLIX radio, Long Island, New York. And she actually inserted those into the picture with the genie bottle and sent that to me yesterday. <laughs> I think it's awesome. It's pretty cool, isn't it? So Allison, thank you very much for taking the time to do that as one of our 
faithful viewers here on the Gym Masters show live. We really appreciate that. That touches me and I think it's beautiful. It was really cool. I was very surprised that just popped up um, yesterday. Uh, that was really, really nice. So we're going to take a look at a couple of comments here and then we are going to wrap up. Stories told in such a relaxing way. Now I am Zen like Jen <laughs> and I'm hardly Zen. Ha. Huh? Well, that's terrific. I'm glad. And uh, it's really, really cool. And it was wonderful seeing Tracy Reiner pop up. Uh, comes from a, a legend of, uh, and, and, and she's extraordinary as well. And her, her dad, uh, Rob Reiner, and grandfather Carl Reiner. And I love, love, I've always loved the work of Carl Reiner, the Dick Van Dyke show, and so much more. He's it was so brilliant. And Rob, of course, a master of his craft as well. So, Tracy, if you're still watching, Welcome to the show. It was a pleasure to see you pop up celebrating our wonderful friend Jack as well. And Christine in North Carolina, thanks for those beautiful comments. Francis, Mr. Jack O'Halloran was super interesting. Wishing him a great night. Sorry you left us so soon. Uh, about two hours. We did a good two hour show, which was great. I don't know if you popped on late. We were on uh, since seven tonight, which is the normal time we start the show. Goodbye, Jim boy. Goodbye, Willie. You have a good night. Hopefully you'll get some good sleep. And um, good night, all lovelies. Good night, Mr. Lovely. Stay safe, everyone, till then. Can't wait for Irish Strong Slancha. Willie sending claps and celebration. Danilo in San Diego. I love those oldies, but goodies. Jennifer. Oh, wow. Can't wait. September 24th. Yes, that's the date. Uh, when, uh, the voices of classic soul are going to be my exclusive special guests that all came together today, today and, uh, members from the temptations, the platters and, um, four tops. I can't believe it. And, and this came to me, they, you know, one of their contacts approached me and said, Hey, would you like to have them on? I said, uh, yeah. And then we picked the date. Yay. Fantastic birthday gift. September 24th. Voices of Classic Soul is going to be awesome. You got that, Christine. I'm off to bed now in beautiful Northern Ireland. Enjoy your evening, everyone. Good night. Good night, Lovity. You're one of the Lovities now watching on uh, YouTube. Thanks for sticking with us, Chris. We appreciate it. Or screen, screen Queen Army. <laughs> Uh, you joined us um, when Lloyd Kaufman was on, which was a, that was a fun show. Thanks, Renee. What a special gift to you, and thanks for sharing it with us. Looking forward to September 24th. Those folks are awesome singers, aren't they? It's going to be really, really special. Pop up for the Lovities. Yes, we'll do it at 1 p.m. Eastern tomorrow. We'll do a quick, very casual, relaxed pop up. We'll see. I won't say anything. We'll just make it a surprise. And that'll be cool. We'll probably be a two-hour show tomorrow. So we're gonna... <laughs> we shall see. We shall see. It's going to be really hot here. Heat wave coming. It's going to be uh, in the 90s. It was beautiful today in the, early, in the high 70s, low 80s. Beautiful day. We were out walking along the coast. Really nice. September 24th. Happy birthday, Jim. Can't wait. Thank you very much. Like the genie bottle. Good magical. Thank you. Cool. This is cool. Cool story. Still amazed by last night's show. He picked up so much information from me. Very cool, huh? Every show is something different. We love it as we continue to grow and expand and tweak and fine tune. And I hope you'll continue to tell all your friends and share the love and light and uh, levity. Did you know, I don't know if you were watching a Biden speech and this isn't political and this isn't, uh, you know, picking one side or another, just ironic how we talk about light levity and love or levity on this show. And in the body of his speech, he had mentioned uh, light, love and hope makes total sense because we certainly need hope about now. But uh, just immediately when I heard the light and the love and the hope, I really thought about our show, the light and the uh, levity and the love, 
Love it. Eh? Cool stuff. Cool stuff. Not too late. 15 minutes. He was just super interesting. Yeah. Oh, you only got to see it for uh, 15 minutes? Yeah. We, we did a full two-hour show. It was incredible. And uh, we covered so much ground. We covered just about everything uh, extensively. So what you can do is if you miss this show, just go to our archives. It'll be saved for you at YouTube at Jim Masters TV. That's where we archive all the shows. You've got about 15 weeks of uh, 15 weeks of shows. Don't forget to relax, everybody. Breathe, take care, be good to one another, love one another. You know, we're going through crazy times, but that doesn't mean that you can't take time for yourself, self-care, self-love, and share that love and the levity with others in your life and around the world. I try to do that and remember to do that while relaxing, which we'll be doing a lot of this weekend. Can't wait. And of course, as you know, before we go, I might be the star of the show, the host and the producer, but I think you guys, the viewers, those who watch and share and tag and celebrate the show like you do and with us every night, I think you guys are the stars. All of you are the stars. You guys are fantastic. I know you guys love the star. I know especially Willie says, yes, my star. There you go. You got your star and the flowers tonight, Willie. You guys are the stars of the Gym Master Show Live. All right, gang. I say goodnight. George Genie Silver, Jimmy does, and so does Gilligan. Bob Denver from Gilligan's Island, our new addition this week to the Gym Master Show Live cast of characters. I toast all of you and you and you and you. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thanks for all this time. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for uh, enjoying and celebrating our fabulous guests, the uh, legendary actor, producer, former heavyweight boxer, Jack O'Halloran. He was a great guest. And I wish you well. I hope you and yours are doing well. I hope everything's good with you and you're healthy and you're smiling and you're in good spirits. That's what we aim for all the time here on the Gym Master Show Live. If you tune in and you're not in a good mood, you're in a rotten mood, you had a rough day or a rotten day, everybody's been annoying you, or you're just very overwhelmed by everything that's going on, um, frustrated, worried, concerned, bored, whatever it is, I'm glad we're here every night for you and yours, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, so we can have fun together and grow this show together. Again, it's still a work in progress. We're fine-tuning, tweaking. I think it's uh, pretty amazing for what it is thus far in just 15 weeks, huh? Good night, everybody. You take care. Yes, love, hope, light, levity, and now love it. You got it. Thanks, Christine. Have a good night. Good night, Jim and company. Mary Bishop. Have a good night, everyone. Renee in Iowa, you too. And Jennifer Barry, night, night. Willie as well, still with us, heading to bed now. Z, she's got uh, one foot in the bed. <laughs> and Christine, good night, Jim Gilligan and all. See you at the pop-up show. Yeah, we're going to do a quick random pop-up show tomorrow, 1 p.m. Eastern, over on YouTube. So I hope you can uh, check us out at YouTube. You had an annoying neighbor today? So I'm glad that you're here with us and hopefully you, you, you know, weren't thinking about that annoying neighbor. That was me last night. LOL. Wait, she had an annoying neighbor. That wasn't you, Jennifer, right? <laughs> no way. Jen is always Zen. Awesome tonight. Thank you very much. I'm glad you enjoyed it, gang. It's a pleasure having you here. Thanks to all the new folks who tuned in. Thanks to you guys for being here as well on the Gym Masters Show Live. We hope you have a great rest of your evening. Thanks for all the time. You be well, you take care. I'll be here tomorrow, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, but we'll also be here a little earlier for a special brief pop-up show. That'll be on YouTube. So the pop-up show is on YouTube at Gym Masters TV. Head over to YouTube. You can even check it out right now to get familiar with YouTube. And, um, and then we'll be back here on YouTube at Gym Masters TV and also Facebook at Gym Masters TV at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific tomorrow, Saturday, starting the weekend together. It's going to be cool. All right, gang. 
Take care. Thanks for being with us on this episode. Your host here, Jim Masters, thanking you for your time this time. Till next time, we shall see you tomorrow. Good night. Thank you.